Right, good morning. Uh, welcome to today's meeting of the Local Pension Committee. This meeting is being broadcast live via YouTube and also be available for viewing after meeting. OK, yeah. OK, so uh, firstly, can I just ask those who are watching online to introduce themselves? I wonder whether James can actually hear. He's, uh, you're on mute, uh, James. If you want to talk to us. Right. Hi, can anybody hear me? Yes, we can. Just need. Yeah, we can. We can hear you, James. Yeah. It's a bit quiet, but. Uh, um. Hi, is, um, is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, we can hear you now. We're Great. just asking anybody online to introduce themselves. OK, great. Um, I'm James Lynch. I'm an investment manager um, at Agon Asset Management, and um, I run your index linked portfolio for you. Thank, thanks very much, James. Uh, um, the next item on the agenda is uh, apologies. I've received apologies from Mr. David Bill. Uh, the next item is uh, the minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of June 2022. I propose the minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of June are taken as read, confirmed and signed. Second. Everybody in agreement? Yeah, that's unanimous. Question time, I receive no questions. Questions asked by members understanding all the 7.3 and 7.5. We have not received any. Um, there are no urgent items. Uh, but so declarations of interest. Does any member have any interest they wish to declare? No. Uh, okay. Yes, I need to declare that I'm leader of Harbour District Council, which is a constituent member of the pension fund. Thank OK, you. thank you. So the next item is the Aegean bond market update, um, which is the first item on the agenda. Uh, I believe, well, we we have, we do have Mr. Richard uh, McGill and Rory Sanderlands with us here today, and Mr. James Lynch is online uh, to present this item. So um, over to you, James, for the presentation. Actually, perhaps I, perhaps I should um, I should kick off. Thanks very much for having okay. us um, here today um, to present the uh, the portfolios that we uh, manage for you. So we will kick off on on the next slide. Um, Ed Bullish, if you don't mind, um, in terms of the client valuation, um, as of the thirty first of October, um, the index link mandate was valued at one hundred seventy seven million, and the short dated climate transition. Uh, mandate that we run for you was was valued at 82.3 million. Um, you will see that there has been a, a modest drop in the valuation uh, of that portfolio since inception and indeed since the top up that, was, that took place in March of this year. And we'll talk through a little bit about why that is the case and what the opportunity and the value is that that portfolio presents going forward uh, over the coming slides. So if we could ask you to turn to the following slide. Um, so in terms of the market review um, this year, obviously, as many of you will be aware, um, 2022 has been a very challenging year for uh, bond markets in general. Uh, there's been a number, number of um, factors uh, playing into that. Obviously, we've been coming at the start of the year. We were coming out of um, the period of the COVID pandemic. Um, inflation um, was uh, proving to be more persistent, it, was, it would be fair to say, than, than perhaps initial assessments of, of its transitory nature uh, would suggest. Uh, and in persistent in inflation, as you'll know, uh, means that um, you know, central banks are more uh, predisposed to increase interest rates to try to control that level of inflation, which is a negative factor for, for bond markets. And, and of course, in addition to that, uh, we had the advent of, of war in, in Ukraine, um, which only exacerbated some of the um, uh, supply chain problems um, uh, that were already um, pertinent following the um, f following the COVID uh, period. So 
the, that that this persistent inflation, um, the the supply chain issues um, exacerbated by the war, and the propensity for central banks to push up uh, uh, base rates over the course of this year uh, to to levels that we haven't seen in a number of years has has all uh, has all um, uh, led to uh, um, an environment that has been very challenging for fixed income securities in general. And you can see the um, the effect on markets in the in the in the slight in the in the charts on this page with um, global investment grade credit spreads moving markedly higher and and yields on government bonds across the globe also mo moving uh, significantly higher. Uh, the uh, I'll maybe pass over um, at this point to my colleague James on online and we'll move on to the following slide. Please do interrupt if there are any questions at any time. Uh, we're happy to uh, to take those and I'll let James talk a little bit about the index link portfolio specifically. Uh, and some of the uh, uh, ramifications, perhaps, of some more recent events in the UK. Okay, yeah. James, um, you. Good morning. Thank you um, for having us today. Um, on the inflation link portfolio, you can see it's quite a, a big drop since the start of the year, um, almost 30%. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, index link bonds are a very long duration heavy asset which means they are very sensitive to movements and in interest rates. So at the start of the year, Bank of England policy rate was at 0.25%. Um, subsequently moved up to 3% um, on, on the bank rate, on the overnight rate. So, but this move means that for every 1% um, move up in interest rates, um, the, the duration of the portfolio is 17 years, which means you'll get a 17% drop for every 1% move in interest rates. And obviously what we've seen this year is a very quick move up higher in interest rates. And that has moved um, all the way along and has hit all these maturities. I mean, the longest bond in this um, portfolio is 2073. Um, so as you can imagine, that there is a big difference um, that happens in the prices now of these bonds. So if, um, the one thing I would add, I mean, this, this is um, an actively managed portfolio. So we do have scope to um, go underweight or overweight the asset class and, uh, and at different bonds, et cetera. And by the end of September, there was a relative outperformance of the fund against the benchmark um, by 0.3%. Um, and if we can go to the next slide and slide five, please, um, we can just show the extent of that move um, and here I'm highlighting, a, a, you know, um, a long bond in the 2068 maturity, which had a price of around 300 at the start of the year. And it took around about eight months for that to half in price down to sort of into the sort of 150 area. And then towards the end of September, there was another um, big fall in the, the valuation of, of index linked bonds and government bonds in the long end as well, um, not just index linked bonds. Um, and this occurred after the September budget and while there was forced selling of the asset class during the disruptions caused by um, the, the forced selling of the, the LDI um, community for the collateral reasons, which obviously been um, well published over over that week and it has, has somewhat recovered um, since the low point at the the end of September. Um, and I think one one question that often um, comes up with regard to the asset classes in a year of rising inflation, would index link bonds not do comparatively better than they, they otherwise would do? Um, and I think, think to answer that is that because it's such a long duration asset, the increase in inflation that we get for one year, for this year, does not have a big knock on effect for bonds longer, say five years, 10 years, all the way out to 50 years from now, because it is just one year. It's just one slice of, um, of that bigger picture and the way that the inflation accrues over many years. So for bonds that are maturing in 2022 or 2023 inflation for this year has yes it has got a much um, better effect 
but for bonds which are longer in maturity it has less less of an effect and also the the the, the selling from the the um sort of the, the pension industry that we had um has also um, exacerbated the move this year um so i'll probably stop there if there's any any questions on this um particular fund or asset class thank you james has uh yeah Declan. Just a just a couple of quick ones. One one is in our in our sort of portfolio at the moment. We we class index linked bonds as one of our sort of protection assets. You know, expecting sort of maybe a bit of stability, but obviously kind of recent history they've been kind of very very volatile. I just wonder what's your thoughts and should we keep classing them as protection or should they sort of I suppose feature in one of the sort of more risky sort of parts of the portfolio? Um, I think I, I guess it would depend on um, the assumption as to how much you know what would be classed as, as risk or protection and what are they being held against? Are they being held against, for example, liabilities or their standalone asset class? I mean, I think if you look back over um, not just the last one year, but the last two or three years, um, the movements that we've seen would suggest that they are, you know, they are becoming a more um, volatile asset class than they have been previously because interest rates themselves are becoming more volatile and they will react to that. So in an environment of um, increased volatility on interest rates, there will be an increased um, volatility in index link bonds. And so the the movement that we've seen this year, where, you know, for example, this the price of this portfolio has moved 30%, I don't think that would be uncommon that we get these types of moves again in the coming years with just the, the macro uncertainty that we have, the inflation uncertainty and how much interest rates now have the ability to move by both up and down. Um, therefore, this type of um, volatility, I, I think, will still be here to stay. Okay, thank, thank you. Just one more. We've got a paper later on the agenda as well, where we're sort of looking at sort of our, our fund valuation assumptions. And in that, with, you know, correct me, I've got it wrong, but we're a sort of 20 year sort of average inflation is going to be 2.9 is what we're, we're forecasting. I just wondered what your sort of thoughts on us in that terms of sort of that, I suppose that, that longish term sort of view of inflation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think obviously what one, um, one thing to note is um, whether it's a CPI inflation or, or RPI inflation, because that, that, that does make a big difference. And um, that's almost sort of um, near sort of 1% difference. Um, but I mean, obviously, since '97, um, when the Bank of England became independent, up to um, the start of the COVID pandemic, you know, we have seen two percent. I think it's been the average on on CPI inflation over that period. Um, I my my assumption is that going forward, that inflation structurally will probably be in a higher place. Than where we were post financial crisis and up to the um, the COVID pandemic, um, it's because the, the forces that have kept inflation low for so long, one by one, have been sort of turned around. Um, how high, you know, how high will they be over a twenty year average? I, I I really don't have an answer for that. I mean, it's it's very difficult to come up with assumptions for that. I think the where where inflation is going to be this time next year or in two years time, you know, economists always get wrong by quite a large magnitude. Um, but I think the where I answer longer term inflation questions would be, I think we'll probably be in a structurally higher inflation environment than lower um, in the years to come. So, uh, just one question: it Is uh, it's sort of ignorance, really? Is the interest actually paid on the nominal value of the the uh, bond to start with, or actually on the decreased value of the bond? Um, yeah. So the it, the so the the interest are paid on um, the nominal value of the bond times by. Um, the RPI rate. So when it comes to um, redemption, it will be the um, the interest times by the where RPI fixing is in, for example, 20 years time. 
versus when the bond was first issued times by the nominal. Yeah, I, I understand that. Thank you. Is, is, is there any more questions? Any more questions? No. So we're on. Yeah. Uh, relating to inflation expectations, is the sort of last 20 years that inflation has been kept low by basically outsourcing to China and now world thinking there's a, the Western world thinking there's a strategic problem about outsourcing to China and they're insourcing things back forward. Is that going to mean that inflation is likely to be higher structurally? Yeah, I think that is that is definitely one of the, the reasons that we um, we think inflation is going to be higher and stickier in the in the future. And I think it's from the from the UK's point of view, um, we have been fortunate over the last sort of 20 years that you know, we have this just in time economy um, where yeah, it's sort of manufacturing um, gets imported in um, through, you know, a, a very um, quick um, global supply chain from areas of the world that make it cheaper than ourselves. Um, and I think we've seen the fragility of supply chains through COVID. And I think, um, I guess, you know, sort of home-based supplies are probably going to look for different routes. And I think there's going to be onshoring of uh, manufacturing, not just in the UK, but that's also a, an issue that's happening in the US as well. Um, so yeah, I think the the security around supply chains, um, not just for for goods, um, but also you've seen it in healthcare, for example, with related to PPE. Um, I'd call it. I guess we we are more aware of the fragilities in the in the the global system than we were before whether it's food security, energy security, supply chain security, and even defense security, um, I think it all leads to structurally higher inflation um, than where we previously had been. Thanks very much for your presentation, James. Now, uh, if there are no further questions, we're asked to note this report. Is everybody happy to note this report? So that's agreed. To come. Oh, is there? Right. I'm sorry. I was trying to... <laughs> You're not. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. We, All right. Carry on. We we can ra we can rattle through these slides yeah. relatively relatively quickly. I know there's a, a packed agenda today. So on six uh, on slide six, the, just to to recap on the the your investment in the short dated climate transition fund. Um, this is a portfolio that has a, a target return of cash plus one and a quarter percent, um, rolling over uh, three years. And you can see there on the on the in terms of the the performance is obviously as alluded to in the in the earlier comments, been a very challenging uh, year uh, this year. Um, but that doesn't take away from the fact that um, you know we still firmly believe that this um, asset class over the <coughs> the medium to long term does display. Um, Characteristics have been very resilient in terms of um, um, yield and capital return. Um, and I'll and I'll I'll move over to the following slide, slide seven, just to to walk through a little bit of why that is. This is the this is the um, the, the experience on the on the left hand side. The chart shows the yield on on a on a short dated index to give a proxy of what's happened with this portfolio. And you can see see the yields risen markedly. Over the over the past 12 months, and that's as a function of both higher uh, short-term interest rates and an increase in credit spreads, and credit spreads increasing because um, that reflects the fact that um, concerns around the sort of macro economy and and the and the sort of fundamental strength of, of corporates is increasing. So the market expects to be paid a higher premium over the risk-free rate in order to compensate for that. Um, but the, but with a yield north of um, five percent. What, as James alluded to earlier, um, with a with a short duration, although although there's been quite a marked move higher in uh, in underlying yields and, and the yield on this portfolio, because its duration is short and only around two years, its sensitivity in terms of price is much much lower than uh, you would see in the in the index linked portfolio that James talked about. Um, so. But what does that mean in terms of um, resilience going forward? That means that you know, at a yield of this of this level, you know, there really is quite a compelling argument for value here, um, um, because the your um, your carry, if you like, from that yield is really quite well protected at the current high 
uh, level of, of, of interest rate that you get. Um, in terms of the actual performance of the, the portfolio, um, you know, we, it is a global portfolio. So although um, UK markets have been particularly volatile over the last couple of months, just with the political un uh, upheaval that we've had, 70% um, of the assets are outside of the uh, outside of the UK, and we've had a better uh, result as a result as a, as a consequence of that in terms of the performance of the fund. So it, it, it's something that you know it, it's been a as I say it's been a very challenging year, but we do think on a on a forward looking basis there's quite a lot of uh, baked into the market in terms of expectation around interest rates, and obviously we are seeing a um, a, a slowing economy. Um, so to that end, um, we expect there to be um, you know better performance in the future in future periods. And um, just in terms of the moves, just to, just to highlight on slide eight. Um, you can see the marked move higher. This is just to give you a sense of what, what's happened. Um, as you know, the, the, the Bank of England's been raising rates quite aggressively, uh, and you can see that in the overnight deposit rate uh, on the left-hand side of the scale. Obviously, that's now up to up to 3%, but you can also see the, the commensurate moves in short-dated gilts and indeed short-dated corporate bonds. So we've given a couple of examples here of, of, of assets that are in the portfolio. Um, Euroclear Bank, incidentally, is a, is a large clearing bank in Europe. It's very highly rated. It, it deals with a lot of custodial issues and transactional issues and is a very defensive uh, asset. And obviously Volkswagen, uh, obviously well-known car company, you can see the, the mark move higher in yields uh, over the past, uh, the past 12 months. Turning to uh, slide nine, I just want to give you a, a brief comment on the outlook. I sort of touched on the fact that, you know, quite a lot of um, expectation in terms of higher rates is already in the marketplace um, in terms of what we expect or the market expects the Bank of England to do in terms of rate rises uh, going forward. Um, the market expects base rates to increase to some, somewhere around, I, I've put four and three quarter percent um, in, in, in the slide deck here. It's actually the market's pricing around four and a half percent peak in base rates now we don't actually think it's going to get even to that level um you know obviously the change of government more recently uh, we saw evidence of this in the budget yesterday with respect to um you know the market's reaction to the um uh, the new chancellor's uh, budget statement it was very muted and i think a, a bit of credibility has been uh, has been um, brought back into the marketplace uh, with with a bit more uh, caution towards some of the uh, fiscal policies um, uh, being taken on. So in that sense, from a supply demand perspective, from the bond market's perspective, um, there's a bit more calm out there uh, than there was perhaps uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and, and as you're well aware, the mortgage rates have been have been pushed significantly higher more recently, and that in itself uh, obviously is leading to a, a degree of slowdown alongside the obvious um, cost of living challenges that we all well, we're all facing. So with that backdrop, we we just don't think that the bank, the bank of England will have the the runway, if you like, to push interest rates. And a lot of the market, uh, the the economy will do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of slowing that inflation rate down. Uh, and they won't actually get to increase rates as high as that. So from that perspective, that leaves us as fixed income investors more constructive on the outlook, not expecting the rate rises to come through that are already expected. Um, so that's really where our, 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 our stance is. Um, and we think actually going forward, the, the next period should be uh, more positive for the portfolio. Happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Rory. Has, has anybody got any questions? Mr. Limona. Oh, there we go. Thank you very much. Just on slide 15 of your deck, 35 of our of our pack, breakdown by credit rating. I just wanted to ask, there's quite a heavy weighting on triple B rated, which I believe is referenced as being investment grade. I'm not sure how much headroom there is beyond that before it's not investment grade. And with the current economic climate and companies potentially being under distress, what's the headroom in terms of sort of that heavy weighting on triple B and the risk of companies slipping beyond that. Yeah, you, you're right. I mean, if you if we're referencing here slide 15 in the deck, and and you can see that the portfolio has got 45% in triple B uh, risk. Actually, the um, um, not to um, place alarm with you given the question, but the the portfolio has a limit of 70% uh, triple Bs, a maximum of 70% triple Bs. So, but that would reflect the the position that we have reflects the fact that. 
um, you know, we are being cautious towards the market. In terms of the rating trajectory, um, despite the economic environment that we're that we're facing at the moment, um, the last few years of very low interest rates have allowed a lot of um, investment grade companies to to term out their debt, to term out to longer maturity debt. Um, and, and one of the benefits of that is that they don't face the same degree of refinancing risk than they might have done in previous cycles. So they have, there's less pressure on them to refinance debt. Now, debt levels have gone up and, you know, there has been a, um, a steady migration of investment grade credits down the rating spectrum towards triple B um, over the past multiple years. That's been a trend that's been in place for quite some time. More recently, though, and with the experience through the COVID pandemic, a lot of corporations um, increased their cash uh, balances and, and their resilience of their balance sheets quite substantially because of that, that event. And so actually are coming into this period of economic slowdown in relatively good health. In actual fact, the the rating agency is that, that signed these credit ratings, um, you know, have had more companies on upgrade than downgrade risk um, all through this year. And it's only very recently that tide is beginning to turn to reflect the fact that, um, you know, the outlook is, is more challenged. Um, now, rating agency um, categorizations tend to be a bit backward looking. So there's, to be fair, you would expect that to happen. I think one of the things that I would um, um, reiterate though in the context of this portfolio it is short dated so we're talking about a portfolio that is um four years is the limit in terms of maturity profile so broadly speaking 25 percent of the bonds mature every year and um, we we don't have any real concern about immediate default risk in these companies there might be the odd company in the in the portfolio that might face pressure over the next 12 to 18 months in terms of downgrade from triple B uh, to, to sub-investment grade. We do have capacity in the portfolio to hold on to those. And we rely on our global credit analyst team to, to make those assessments about their um, access to market. Really, that's the trigger. Um, and their ability to refinance that debt is really the, the key uh, key concern for us. And we're re I'm, I'm relatively sanguine about that, despite the economic outlook. I'm very confident that all the all the securities in the portfolio will be repaid. Okay, if we uh, do, 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 just going to ask, um, given what we've got, uh, yeah, I yeah, I I would just um, uh, very briefly turn to slide. Um, Slide 10, just I'll, I'll, I'll go to slide 10 and, and we'll talk about uh, very briefly. So in in, um, in the middle of this year, June, July of this year, the fund's name was changed to the Aegon Global Climate Transition Fund. And this reflected um, a piece of work that was being done um, uh, in order to um, um, factor in some a climate transition framework um, into the portfolio uh, to reflect the uh, new a new investment philosophy um, and, and to really um, try to um, future proof the fund and, and future proof its, its, its relevance to investors like yourselves and as climate risk is evidently becoming more and more of a challenge for uh, pension funds uh, and, 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 and the whole range of investors. So what, what that means in, in practice is that the fund seeks to direct its investments to uh, those companies that we've assessed have the have the most robust and credible uh, transition plans towards a net zero future. Um, now, this is work that's done by our own uh, responsible investment team, and we categorise companies across five categories from leader leader to laggard, and, and you can see some statistics on that uh, later in the pack. Um, these um, climate guidelines are really uh, there to, to, to steer us, and over time, the portfolio will be uh, adjusted um, and they're quite a lot. It's quite a long time horizon. So the first date where the the categories that we're allowed to invest and in shift more towards those better categories um, is uh, is in 2024. And then there's another date in 2029. Now remember, if it's a if it's a four year uh, bond portfolio, our ability to move that portfolio into those better companies is quite flexible given the the, the constant process of maturing bonds. Um, so we, what we'll do over time is align that more closely to those companies that we see as the, the leaders and more prepared names um, and those names that fail to see or fail to improve their 
uh, transition credentials will, uh, will, will, will be disinvested, um, probably most likely by not being reinvested in rather than being sold, uh, given the, the short dated nature. The output of that, um, um, the output of that uh, uh, work means that we also have a, a, an additional uh, target within the portfolio that we main, aim to maintain its weighted average carbon intensity, which is a commonly used measure um, of, of carbon impact across portfolios, at least 30% below uh, the reference universe. So we are, we are, of course, a cash benchmark fund, but we use uh, a, a reference index to to compare against. So at the moment, the fund is in excess of 60% below uh, that that index. So obviously, well within within that target. In addition to that, we also um, adopt uh, an ESG best in class approach uh, within the portfolio, and that really just means that the portfolio is biased towards those companies with better ESG credentials. So what that means in practice is that we, although climate is a particular consideration within the context of that framework, we're not ignoring uh, companies that have poor governance or poor social uh, aspects to them. We certainly wouldn't find a place uh, in the portfolio. So it's not an exclusive uh, climate consideration. It's more of a, a blend between those two factors to make sure and, and really, the, the, the point of, of, of doing this is to help investors um, in an overall sense position their portfolio uh, uh, in a more sort of climate ready fashion uh, going forward. And I hope that uh, bears relevance here. Um, but it also, from a, from a portfolio management's perspective, um, adds additional resilience to the portfolio. It's a short dated but fund. We're trying to keep the volatility to to, to a minimum. Um, we're trying to invest in a relatively defensive fashion, uh, and and in, incorporating these considerations, um, I would argue, um, increases the resilience of that portfolio going forward. Thanks very much, Rory. Are there any other questions, Adam? Good. Um, that was very interesting. Thank you. Um, just uh, you talked about blending. Um, you talked about a um, a framework. Um, within that, are there metrics or trigger points that would lead to kind of what I describe as staged disinvestment? So I'm not sure whether you can um, whether that's possible at all. But I'd just be interested to know how, how, what is the pathway that you're describing now. Yeah, unfortunately, we haven't actually got the slide that shows the pathway of the portfolio okay. over time. But in terms of an of an individual um, company, I think it's important to emphasize that this is not the, the, the first of all, this is not an exclusionary approach to climate transition. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, invest in those companies best positioned for the transition. So no, one of the ways you could um, if your question is specifically about more of the climate side of it, one of the trigger points um, might be that, you know, their targets that they've set aren't hit. So, for example, one, the, so very briefly, the way we think about it is not focusing in on a specific metric like carbon intensity. That is a very big factor. So both carbon emissions in an absolute sense and weighted average carbon intensity in a relative sense are incorporated. We then look at what the, the, the targets that these companies have set themselves in terms of reducing those footprints over the next 10, 20 years. Most companies we invest in unsurprisingly have a, we're going to be net zero by 2050, but we're more interested in the interim targets, whether they're robust and how corporate strategy is aligned with the, with hitting those targets over time. So there's a, a, a bit more of a holistic assessment of how that um, will work. And those, then, those companies are then um, uh, considered on that basis and then with particular sectors, so heavy emitting sectors like, for example, the oil and gas sector or the utility sector. And we also incorporate banks and insurance companies within those um, um, high, inf what we call high influence sectors. And the reason banks are there because they can attribute capital to and, and influence the transition in that sense. So th we then consider all those uh, th those sectors and make what we call a sector specific adjustment. But that's just that that process is really considering a few sector specific factors and making a judgment as to who the better names within those sectors are and who the, the laggards are within those sectors. 
So it's not. So when you ask me about triggers, the the assessment is a more holistic uh, assessment than focusing on one quantitative metric like carbon intensity or, or absolute emissions. But the trigger for disinvestment, I think, will come. Um, the portfolio first has to review in 2024, and those names, a lot of companies will have have targets, initial targets, because this process of setting targets is relatively new for a lot of corporations. So a lot of targets, a lot of companies have targets in 24, 25 period, and then again in 2030, and then 2035, out towards 2050. So the reckoning will come initially around the 25 area because there'll be targets from companies have they hit those targets that will be a, a point at which there'll be an opportunity to review now we don't leave it until then to review i'll give you a very brief example so we one one name that we have in the portfolio um that is a laggard so that's the bottom rung is stellantis now stellantis might not mean anything to you but that's chrysler fiat car companies that's the holding company for a lot of, a lot of the different car brands so they they are a laggard because they don't have um or they haven't had particularly strong targets for electric vehicle rollouts and the like they've recently um established a lot of those targets and have started rolling out models and are much more and align their corporate strategy more towards us. So that's a name that we could see moving up in from the laggard category up to the next category, which we call unprepared. So there is two ways that, that this can change. It's either the companies are going to improve or they'll be ultimately disinvested because they haven't said what they were going to do. OK, any more questions? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Um, thank, first of all, thank you very much for the um, answer to Adam's question, which I think was very uh, illuminating. I was going to ask a similar question, but maybe you can illustrate this in relation to Anglian Water, which on the slide says is unprepared. What does that mean and how can you use your, uh, you know, the, the, the method you've been describing to get them in a better state? Yeah, so... Um... Angling water is unprepared because um, the um, within our within that it, the initial assessment is what we call a base assessment. So that would be those considerations of what have they done to date, what have they, um, uh, uh, what are their targets over the over the over the medium term and the long term, and how aligned is their corporate strategy with those targets. Um, they then they'll then get uh, a sector uh, adjustment and within their sector they are one of the weaker uh, names compared to some of their peers in terms of you know the other names in that sector Northumbrian Water, United Utilities, all the other water companies in the UK they'll be compared to those names in terms of those ambitions and those targets and the realism of those targets and where whether their corporate strategy is aligned to them so that's why they come out as unprepared and other names within the utility sector will be prepared. You can see eBedroller on there is prepared. That's another, that's the Scottish power owner, Spanish utility company. NL above it is a, is, is transitioning. So the, the categories are laggard is the bottom, then it's unprepared, then it's transitioning, then it's prepared, and then it's leader. That makes sense. Uh, I th I, yes, I won't pursue it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, uh, James, and thanks, Rory, for the presentation. Now, if there are no other questions, uh, we're asked to note this report. Is it agreed? It's agreed. Thanks very much. So we're now on to item seven, uh, and this is the outcome of the net zero climate uh, strategy targets and draft strategy and responsible investing updates set out on pages 39 to 130. Uh, we welcome Zena Zelta from the Climate Action Leicester in Leicestershire, who is here to speak against the submitted consultation response. So if you join us at the table, oh, Zena, you have five minutes, so uh, start when you're ready. Hello, I'm, is this working? Yeah, brilliant. I'm Zena Zelta from Climate Action Leicester in Leicestershire. We represent thousands of people in the county and the city, many of whom are members of your pension scheme, as well as dozens of community groups. Thank you for letting me speak today about your net zero strategy. 
governments listen to the financial world. We've really seen that in the last few weeks in response to the mini budget. So it's essential that financial investors like pension funds push governments to support a shift away from our fossil fuel dependency as fast as possible. The UN scientists say that we're on a pathway to global warming of more than double the 1.5 degree limit that would keep the world safe from spiraling climate change. As you set your net zero strategy, you have a responsibility to look after the futures of all your pet fund members, including the youngest among them who will live with the decisions we make today. So we're asking you to include three actions in your strategy. One, formally stop investing in all fossil fuel companies which continue to develop new oil, gas and coal reserves. Two, shift your climate engagement to the banks and insurance companies, which we've just heard are leaders in this area who you invest in, these companies could play a major role in accelerating the global path to net zero. And three, invest some of your funds in local projects that actively provide solutions to climate change and fuel poverty. Taking these in turn, the fossil fuel companies you invest in do not only produce oil, gas and coal, they also put the vast majority of their capital expenditure into developing new fossil reserves. This is unsustainable from a climate and an investment perspective. Not only are scientists clear that the world cannot afford to use even the oil, gas and coal in the sites already in production, but returns are increasingly at risk as the world shifts to renewables and these companies become unable to sell their products. Now is likely to be the most profitable moment you will ever see to share, sell these investments. As a local government pension fund, the social license that you give these oil, gas and coal companies by investing in them is far stronger than your voice as a shareholder. Only by divesting can you remove your implicit support for their opening up of new reserves. Cristiana Figueres, former UN climate chief who led the Paris talks, says financial bodies divesting from fossil fuels gave governments the voice and impetus they needed to reach and agree the Paris Climate Agreement of 1.5 degrees. Our second suggestion for your climate strategy is that you focus your climate engagement on banks and insurance companies. We strongly support you engaging with the companies you invest in to get them to reduce their carbon emissions. However, we're concerned that you focus your engagement on fossil fuel companies. It's other companies without expensive pipelines, rigs and fossil fuel infrastructure who are leading and enabling the energy shift to renewable power and other solutions that the world needs. Instead of engaging with fossil fuel companies who cannot change with the urgency required, we want to see you engage with the banks and insurance companies you invest in, such as JP Morgan. These are the key organisations that enable fossil fuel companies, you've just heard this, to continue developing new reserves. Without their support, fossil fuel companies could not afford to develop the new reserves which are risking our future. Our third ask is that you'd invest locally in projects which help councils and communities to tackle climate change and fuel poverty here. You're allowed to invest up to 5% of your funds locally. You could offer investment to our councils to enable them to build wind and solar farms, to put solar panels on all council roofs and to build net zero social housing. You could invite the councils in this pension scheme to create such projects for you to invest in. So our three asks for your climate strategy are one, to publicly end your support of fossil fuel companies by rescinding the public license you give their activities by investing in them. Two, to engage strongly with the banks and insurance companies you invest in to urgently stop funding and insuring fossil fuel companies to open up new fossil reserves which the world cannot afford to burn. And ask three, that you invest locally in projects which reduce carbon emissions and fuel poverty here. We beg you to please use all the powers at your disposal to push the world towards net zero as fast as possible and to seriously discuss and consider, including the actions we've suggested in our quite detailed consultation response to, to in your net zero strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sina. Thanks. So if you would like to uh, take take a seat, thanks very much for coming in today and presenting. So um, we now have Kat Tui, who's our responsible investment analyst, who will present this report. So over to you, Kat. Good morning, members. Um, so. Before um, I begin, I'll just like to thank Zena for her representations and their response to our engagement. And it, it was very 
detailed and well thought out response. So we have um, seriously kind of taken that into account as we've been developing the strategy. Um, but it probably leads well into um, the first part of the report, which covers fiduciary duty and what factors the committee can consider in their decisions, um, which is especially important while we're considering development of the net zero climate strategy. Um, so we requested advice from um, Leicestershire County Council's legal services, and that's set out in Appendix D, which is page 125 of your PACs. Um, and then we have uh, Lauren Haslam, who's the Director of Law and Governance at Leicestershire County Council with us, who's going to take us through that legal view. Thank you, Kat, and good morning, everyone. Um, as, as Kat's mentioned, there's a detailed note in the appendix to the report, um, but to summarise, um, the fiduciary duty reflects a legal requirement on the fund and the committee to act and make decisions in the best interest of scheme members and employers. This is achieved by exercising discretionary powers uh, in a reasonable and rational way, taking account of advice uh, to achieve the best financial outcome for the scheme members and employers. Thinking about this in the context of investment strategies, there's a requirement in the relevant regulations that advice is taken on investment decisions, and that's supplemented by the statutory guidance, which reinforces the requirement on the committee to act prudently and to uh, take advice when considering the investment strategy. The statutory guidance does provide that other factors such as environmental, social and governance factors can be taken into account as these are potentially uh, material factors, but importantly that's a secondary consideration to the predominant duty of acting in the best financial interests of the fund. Also to note that such factors may only be taken into account if this would not involve significant risk or detriment to the fund and when, the, when there's good reason to think that the scheme members would support the decision. Uh, just to conclude, as set out at paragraph eight, the pension committee would not be act would would be acting unlawfully if the investment decisions following advice uh, risks conflict with the fiduciary duty to the funds or risks lower investment returns. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'll just go on to um the rest of the report. So. Um, I'll go through this briefly because I know members have been briefed and it, it is quite a long report. So members will remember at the June committee meeting, you approved that the fund go out for consultation on the draft targets and measures in development of the net zero climate strategy. So that ran from the 5th of July to the 18th of September. Um, and we received over a thousand responses, which um, was, I think, a lot more than we, we would have expected from similar engagements with other funds. So a full outcome um, of the engagement is attached as Appendix B. Um, and then, of course, we also received a small amount of correspondence um, from some individuals who expressed their views did not neatly fit into the questionnaire, and that included um, Climate Action Leicester and Leicestershire's response, and that's also um, attached to Appendix B. So if I kind of just focus on um, maybe the, the first primary target, so net zero by 2050 with an ambition for sooner, um, we saw a high level of support for this, so over um, so 70 percent agreed with this ambition, um, and then we saw uh, similar response rates for all of our underlying um, measures and targets. So between about 60 and 70, and over 70 percent in some cases. Um, within the report, we've highlighted where some changes are proposed to what was engaged on. Um, these are primarily to do with simplifying the measures, where um, I think they were quite they're a bit more complicated to understand and so just trying to simplify that and then also um, better aligning them to the net zero investment framework which obviously we're trying to follow as part of best practice. Um, I won't go over the other primary measures obviously members can um, obviously ask uh, questions in more detail but um, on the secondary targets so these are all the underlying targets which will help us achieve our um, primary ambition of net zero by 2050 so these secondary targets are about um, reducing fossil fuel fuel exposure and then also increasing our um, exposure to climate solutions along um, a few of us so again um, high level of support, support for these and um, a few amendments to targets where um, simplification or kind of clarification is required 
Um, I will just highlight the on one of the additional questions. So we asked um, members what was um, which most closely described their views um, on whether the fund should follow a policy of divestment or engagement. So this was um, kind of unsurprisingly probably our most di um, divisive question. So we had 35% preferred engagement um, and 31% preferred divestment. Um, and then also 22% were neutral on the matter. We um, had quite a lot of underlying comments on this question. So all the comments really reflected that divisive view of both in terms of um, those that prefer divestment think that's the best way to make an impact or um, those that support engagement um, don't want to lose that seat at the table with those companies. So um, that was quite a, um, a varied response rate, but kind of reflects the, the more um, general investment view on um, both. Um, I will just highlight also, so we also had um, some questions on respondents' um, knowledge of the fund's fiduciary duty and also what the fund is invested in. Um, that level of knowledge was relatively low, but um, the fund is going to pick that up as a, a wider view for communication with scheme members. Um, obviously, Kazina's um, presented to the committee today on, on her um, on Climate Action's three points about um, formally divesting um, engagement with banks and then investing in um, local products. That uh, the fund's response um, is within um, paragraph 38. So I, I think also it's probably worth highlighting we do engage with banks um, and that's, um, that's been highlighted in some of the quarterly reports which um, you, you get at each um, committee meeting. But we can probably do more to, to bring that out in future um, quarterly updates. So that was all I was going to say on the engagement, if I just briefly go on to the um, strategy. So obviously um, following that engagement, we um, developed the net zero climate strategy. So that's attached as Appendix A. So that outlines our strategic approach to managing climate risk um, and a proposed approach to achieving net zero by 2050. So this is ultimately our ambition to decarbonise without sacrificing financial returns. Um, so protecting the fund from climate risks um, and trying to engage with companies to, to drive change and seek out attractive investment opportunities. And again, that's just been that's been developed in line with, you know, Heimitz Robertson. They came to the June meeting and they gave their view on the, the targets. Um, and then we've also obviously had our climate risk report, which you'll have with the next, next agenda item. So we've got a full view of um, a kind of the risk um, and why we need to manage this. Um, the strategy includes four key sections. So we have the climate change risks and opportunities, the targets and measures, um, decision making, so how the fund can integrate that into its general day to day um, work and kind of work of the committee. And then our approach to stewardship engagement and divestment. And that's um, very much in line with um, kind of trying to drive change through our companies, but then also recognising there is a chance, there is a time where divestment is um, necessary. And I think it was really interesting to have um, Aegon here today, because I think their view of um, divesting or kind of engagement is probably the approach we'd want most of our managers, to, or if not all of our managers to take in terms of choosing those, um, those companies that are better placed for transition rather than those companies that are going to ultimately possibly be stranded have their assets stranded. So it just goes on to say we'll review the, um, the, the, the strategy at least every three years and then monitor progress annually. So although we don't have short term targets, we will be having that kind of expecting that reduction year on year where possible. But obviously that's not necessarily, um, it, it won't necessarily be a, a kind of a smooth um, line down. And then there's obviously still a lot of work for the fund to do behind the scenes, so create further asset plans so we can um, look at more than just our equities class um, and then also um, work with our managers to kind of set out our expectations and understand their own net zero targets and commitments. Given the interest, I think we've proposed to go out to consultation on the strategy itself, so that'll be similar to um, 
the engagement we've done previously um, and advertise in a similar way and do, um, undertake it for about 11 weeks. And then ultimately the, the, the strategy would come to committee in um, March. So I don't know if, if I want to stop there, maybe then we can have all the questions on the strategy. Thanks very much, um, Kat, a pretty comprehensive report. Um, uh, Malise. Yeah, just quickly, um, the Climate Action Leicester and Leicestershire talked about local investment and we've got a very good answer for them really in a way, but have we actually discussed with them what they would put forward as, a, as something we could invest in locally? I mean, we've not had that um, discussion with them. I know they've just met um, mentioned about, um, I think, us going out to our local councils and seeing if they've got and telling them to kind of almost submit um, ideas to us. But um, I think I think the committee's discussed this uh, a few times before, and I think it would lead itself to um, a lot of conflict of interest for the committee. Obviously, you have your your other hats that you're sitting on here. So, um, and also the the count the the pension fund doesn't have, I guess, the resource to manage individual investments so it's we basically outsource our, our, our money to our investment managers and they do it on um, our behalf so you know if they see a, an investment in the local area that's attractive then I'm sure they'll go for it it's just we don't have um, I guess that, that resource. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with that but um, I feel felt it should be asked because yeah. it's really on the face of it, it looks a sensible suggestion, but there are, it is far more complicated than it seems. But thank you. Just one bit to add to that slightly, local councils as well can access capital cheaper than we'd, we'd lend it to them as well. So it's kind of, I know it's a, it's a quirk of local government and, you know, that's not common probably to the universities, but they can access sort of through the, the Public's Works Loan Board, et cetera. So it's kind of, we'd be trying to sort of step into a space that's kind of already fulfilled, I think. Mr King. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, Chairman. Um, so I actually agree with the recommendations, although I don't agree with everything that's in the report or the uh, consultation, but I want to just draw out a couple of additional points that weren't mentioned. Actually quite a significant pe number of uh, people who responded to the survey who don't agree with any action on climate change. I think it's about 20%. And given that uh, people who responded to this I'm sure were highly motivated because they're very interested in the subjects. So it's a kind of a bit of a difficult one to know how realistic the view of the, the, the actual people who were consulted with, whether that is a kind of, if, if you actually did kind of independent polling with them, rather than asking them a set of loaded questions, what the response would be in terms of what would come back because by asking a lot of very highly motivated questions, uh, you do tend to get people responding more quickly, you know, in a kind of uh, more highly. Um, the, other, the other point I just wanted to pick up was this local investment. I actually, what I've just heard, I don't think is a satisfactory answer. I think um, this is a long standing, you know, this is an issue that uh, pension fund, the government has been saying for a long time that pension funds can invest locally. Now, we should have a strategy for local investment. Um, whether that includes measures to do with uh, green energy and all that sort of stuff, that's a that's a, a, a by the by, I think, or not a by the by, but that could be a useful uh, thing that happens. But I think it is important that the pension fund does have a local uh, a local investment strategy. If we don't have one. For, um, um, rather than it being left to uh, the uh, central pension fund managers to kind of, you know, on a kind of ad hoc basis, oh, there's something there we might invest in, which I, I, I know you didn't quite say that, but it wasn't far off. Um, so I think we, you know, Chairman, I think if, if, you know, I think irrespective of this particular issue, I think I'm kind of thinking there needs to be a local investment strategy so that, you know, we, we have got a very clear um, uh, plan of, of how, you know, suitable local investment opportunities can be brought forward 
to the fund managers to then assess and make those decisions rather than the committee here deciding that obviously their own little pet uh, project in their own backyard is the one that we should back and i think that so th but anyway look there needs to be some thought and a mechanism put in place to look at that because at the moment i don't think we have got an adequate route to do that um but uh, without dwelling any more on this i really think that the strategy because uh, it's a draft strategy to go out for consultation i think that's what we need to do um, I think if you start divesting and start saying we're going to divest from this fund and that fund very quickly, uh, it kind of r reminds me of other um, campaigns in the past by other organisations to divest from different um, from various groups of investments. And I think you're just walking. And as, as Lauren Hasman said, you know we're not able for this. You know our duty is to get the best return and not kind of. Um, mix the politics up too much um you know we're not allowed to do that and um i for one i'm not going to do that thank you thanks very much uh, phil uh chris maybe i could try and respond to that um yeah i mean i mean cat mentioned the conflict of interest is clearly clearly an issue but it, there is the, it, it's, the, it's the expense and the due diligence and the work you need to require if you're going to look at individual schemes. We, we're just not geared up to do that. We can bring something back to a future committee to kind of expand on the thoughts about why we haven't done that in the past. And just kind of picking up on Declan's point is generally well, local authorities can access far cheaper capital than they would be able to via the pension fund. I know Leicestershire County Council are building a solar farm. Um, and, and our sources of capital are far cheaper than if we'd gone to this pension fund to borrow some money from it. So there's, there are some sort of fundamental reasons why we haven't gone down that route, but we can bring something back in a bit more detail back to committee. And that'd be useful. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Mr. Well, Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, first of all, um, well, I've got a comment about um, one of the targets. Um, it's on page 78 of, of the pack. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to quickly. Um, I mean, I would I would tend to contest um, Mr. King's observation about uh, the number of people who are, uh, who are not so concerned about climate change. I think scientifically run opinion polls over many years, and increasingly so, are showing you know a, a significant majority of the pop general population have real concerns about climate change. Um, so I would say that the survey, the consultation that's been done here is, you know, is something we can take note of and really um, based on on that understanding of the broader feelings of outside of outside of the actual scheme members. Um, in terms of the target, um, which is 90% of the funds financed emissions are classified as achieving next zero aligned or aligning or subject to an engagement program to build. Well, this this uh, draft, by the way, says build that about. I presume it is meant to say bring that about. But um, anyway, uh, my point about that is, um, and I've discussed, I've mentioned this before at previous meetings about, you know, criteria for when going through an engagement program is fine, but what, what are the criteria for then making a decision to say, right, OK, we've get engaged with you. We're regarding you as what Agon call a laggard company. You know, you're not getting there. You know, when are we what are the criteria to trigger withdrawal in, of investment from laggard companies? And I'd, I'd like I'd really like to see something referring to that in this target. So you could just go on to say subject to the engagement program to bring that about or subject uh, or, uh, uh, to bring that about and clear criteria to trigger withdrawal and investment from laggard companies is what something I would like to see. And I mean, I'm not just looking at this car target. I'm also looking further down in the strategy right at the end where there's the stewardship approach um so that's that four stage four steps stewardship approach obviously there is a step for covering divestment um and, and i 
I'd really like to ask a question really of, of whoever might be able to answer, you know, where does it specify in the draft net zero climate strategy what the fund's red lines will be over companies who fail to respond to climate transition concerns raised by that engagement? Because I'm not seeing anything either in this target or in that stewardship approach at the end there. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks sir. Uh, Kat, are you able to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, um, that target about 90% um, of the funds finance missions that we're um, going to be classified as net zero aligned or aligning and also to engagement, that's something we're working with um, Central on, um, who are at the back of the room in terms of how we can um, measure that in the first instance. And I think that will give us a, a good starting point. At the moment, we can kind of see um, companies have a net zero target um, and then the information below that is um, less, which is kind of why we're going to use the Climate Action 100 or um, Transition Pathway Initiative data to kind of help us actually measure the data below that. Um, in terms of setting some red lines, it's it's a difficult position, although I think in the future we will look to have um, kind of targets about how much should be aligning by, you know, whatever year. Um, and then that would probably lead on to, you know, um, kind of ex expect ex expectations about that but it's it's hard to kind of set a, a clear line because each of the um kind of sectors beneath that will have their their own different transition pathway um kind of to net zero so it's kind of hard to set um, um a hard and fast rule for for that that target but i think as we develop this and we have more data on the underlying companies and also more companies are being um transparent about that data that should be um something that that comes future iterations. Adam. Thank, thank, thank you, Chair, um, and, and thank you, Kat. I think I'll press you what I'm going to say by saying I think I probably want another conversation because this the pack today is, is so huge and actually to digest all of this is, um, you know, is almost impossible. Um, so I probably would like to, to set up a meeting at some point, Kat, with yourself and, and maybe colleagues just to discuss through kind of more detailed questions. But I, I, I do have a, a fundamental issue that there is a kind of received wisdom here that um, there are opposing ideologies of engagement and divestment. And I and I think that comes out in, in the report. And I think the report is, oh, sorry, the, the, the draft strategy is quite confused in that way. Uh, and the questions were confused in that way because it asked whether you prefer engagement or divestment, when actually um, I think the two can coexist peacefully if we work through this properly. And I think there is a continuum of spectrum that we need to develop, that we heard developing from Aegon. I think if, if we all agree that that's emerging good practice, we should try and align what Aegon have told us with the strategy that we're we're developing. Um, I think that the most effective approach would be that would be to try and develop that continuum and that comes back to what was called red lines earlier and what I call trigger points in my question to Aegon and what and whilst yes we need to have this blended approach we need to recognize ESG kind of more holistically um, I think we do need to recognize that we, we do need to understand actually when have we gone too far here um, or, or when is engagement not working um, and that increasingly needs to be earlier than we might have anticipated three, six, nine years ago. And that will only get earlier as you move forward. And we hear what the final outcomes of COP27 are. I'm sure we'll start to think actually we need to be even more focused on trigger points for disinvestment. Um, so I think there should be an explicit threat of divestment. I think there is, um, if you recognise what the risk to the fund is, which is under 5%, of total investment, and we think about what the risk is to polluters of divestment, I think you can see that our risk is so much lower than any risk of us um, moving towards divestment with Shell um, or another kind of um, polluting organisation at that scale. Um, I think we need to think more about actions. Targets are great. It's got, they've got to be followed by actions and if you look at all of these companies a lot of them are setting targets but they're not backing it up with real action i think we, i think it's very easy to discover that um and this is difficult for me as a councillor because it's you very rarely come come up with sort of kind of on matters of conscience um you know i'm considering whether i'm going to watch the world cup for instance chair you know that's a matter of conscience for me and this is a matter of conscience because this is about um you know this is about r real lives um um that now and in the future and it is about whether we are 
ourselves laggards. Um, and I am pushing for the word laggards to be introduced to the to the draft document because I think you know I think we are we are at risk of being called laggards, and I don't want that. Um, and and I won't um, uh, you know and, and I'll argue against that. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thanks very much uh, for your thoughts, Adam. Thank you. And uh, I think Kat's noted all that. Kat, would you like to say something? Yeah, I, I, um, I'll apologise if it comes across in terms of it was, I know the question was worded in that way, but I think in the strategy itself, we, we can definitely take those those points on board, on board in terms of strengthening the relationship, because it's not, it's not either or, it's, um, you know, it's engagement and divestment. Um, because yeah, we I, we recognise there is a value in and a need to divest from companies that would ultimately um, harm the funds. But you kind of got to try and push them along as as far as possible. Because otherwise, you know, those really high emitters they're going to affect the rest of our um, our fund in any case, even if we don't have them in the in the fund. Thank you. Yeah, fiduciary duty. Um, the fiduciary duty is obviously open to legal opinion um, and I'll be interested to know what client Earth's legal opinion of the fiduciary duty in re relation to climate change is because I, I you know I think there's a strong argument that actually we are working against our fiduciary duty if we do not have strong climate action within our strategy. Thanks very much for those thoughts Adam. Um, Mr Grimley do you want to say something? Yeah, just just quick few few, few words. Uh, it's a it's a good starting point as report, and uh, uh, thank the officers for putting the time in 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 on this. It's uh, certainly uh, a good step in the right direction. I think there does need to be more work, but I think it is um, uh, at least we're getting a starting point here here on this. Um, I mean, I, I did pick up the uh, point uh, about. Um, Aegon, when they they rank their companies, so they have um, or the pension, they have have uh, Lagard at the bottom. But they also did say with on on the Lagards, they they will look into and delve into more information on the Lagards as well. So just having sort of a um, you know a lead table, as it were, it is isn't always right and there does need to be. I think it's it's right to rank them, but then to um, look at them individually and just just see what they're doing how they are um sort sort of move Move, move, moving away from uh, um, you know, the uh, heavy, heavy um, uh, for, um, uh, climate, climate, you know, problems with climate, climate, climate and how, how they're moving for, for, forward on that. So yeah, I think think it's a, uh, a good good report. Is um, just pick on uh, Adams, uh, sorry, Councillor Clark's um, uh, comment. There are lots of different legal opinions on different things, and different organised vested organisations will have their own um, sort of opin opinion on that, and they they hire their you know that they're, they're, they're people to uh, uh, argue up points as well so it just needs to be a bit care careful on that but uh, it's, it's, it's certainly worth reviewing that that side of things as, as well just to make sure that we are acting uh, in a neutral way, way as an organization thank you thanks very much and mr warnington thank you chair um i heard cap say that um further consultations on this report were uh, going to be undertaken. So um, my comments really relate to how that might be done. This document that we've received, of course, is, is, is very uh, weighty and it would not be, uh, I think, wise to expect many people to read through it all uh, and respond. But the points that have been made in the discussion this morning from members here, uh, I think are very important and should definitely be highlighted as issues where opinions might be sought uh, and where points have been made. So can we receive a bit more information about how and when this further consultation might take place? Thank you. Yeah. We uh, expand a little bit more. Um, we're well aware how um, I think the strategy itself is over 30 pages, so very kind of cognizant of the fact that is um, that would be hard for many people to engage on. And we also had um, feedback as, for, as part of our first engagement um, where some people found it kind of difficult to um, respond to some of the questions because they were kind of a bit um, a bit too kind of wordy or complex. So we're definitely taking that into account as part of how we'll um, do this next stage of consultation. We're, we've worked with um, the, the comms team at Leicestershire County Council and we've created a summary document. So that's about um, less than eight pages on the strategy. So that um, kind of 
hits the, the key points um, that we're covering in the strategy. And then we're going to go out to um, consultation where it it kind of just asks if people agree or it, sorry, if people, you know, if they support the strategy, do they have anything that they think is missing from the strategy? And then if they have any further points, so very kind of a brief um, consultation so people can um, comment as much or as little as they, they might want to. Um, but how we kind of go out to this, so we're going to email all of our um, employers through the employer bulletin and then um, email all of our scheme members who we actually have their emails for, so that's about 40,000, and then also advertise it on our um, scheme website. Um, I don't know if that helps at all. If there's... Just briefly, it would be very helpful to see. Yeah, OK, so what do you want to see? What would you like to see? What, well, what is I've, it you want? I've, I've just heard that there's been an eight page summary yeah, produced with I'm questions. Sure we'll do that. We'll and do I think that. all all the members here would yeah. probably like to see that and, and uh, have fine. the opportunity yeah, to make any suggestions. That. Yeah, well, we can do that, can we, Kat? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I can circulate it after the meeting. Um, we are kind of in a bit of a time crunch if we need to. So um, I, I would ask members to kind of feedback as soon as possible, just because um, you know, we want to give people as long as possible, especially over the Christmas period. And then we only have until obviously we want to report um, the final strategy in March just so we can kind of get it in place. OK, I mean, we're going to take into account a wide range of views, as you can see within the committee this morning. People do feel strong there. I think climate change is very important. Adam. Yeah, I mean, we've heard a lot about um, the potential for loaded questions and interpretation of questions. I think uh, uh, Mr King um, you know, mentioned it himself. And I think uh, an eight page document that we haven't seen going out to consultation that could be interpreted um, in one way or another. I think as a committee that does have a broad spectrum of views, we should have an opportunity to say whether on uh, in a formal forum, actually, we should have an opportunity to say whether we think it's an appropriate document to go out to consultation, because I think between us, um, we could probably find the most neutral um, approach, um, given the range of the, given the range of people around this table. So it's very disappointing that it hasn't come to this forum. Chair. Sorry, I'll just it, 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 it's, it's literally just a summary of the strategy um, and it's it, it went through our um, um, engagement team at the County Council and we've gone through our comms team because um, we have been we don't want to have the leading questions. So we have been very kind of um, clear in that we just have simple questions, but I, we'll, we'll share that with you um, for sure. But that's it, it has gone through our um, engagement team. Okay. And it's part of best practice. Thanks very much, Karen. Uh, uh, so, has anybody got any? No. Uh, very interesting. Um, in terms of the legal opinion, presumably there's absolutely nothing in the legal opinion that stops us investing in infrastructure that's weighted towards climate change if we think that that's going to get a reasonable amount of income. Um, and in terms of, I agree with Councillor Clark, is that Diver and, and the Aegon, which was a very interesting presentation, is that it isn't all or nothing between engagement and disinvestment. Um, and just a couple of sort of comments that sort of tie that through. World changes. An investment has to reflect that and try and preempt some of that within that. My grandfather made a lot of, you know, made a good living manufacturing typewriter ribbons. <laughs> um, it wouldn't have been a good investment for the fund. Uh, we we should have probably we didn't have much in investments in Russia, fortunately, but we should probably have divested beforehand entirely. Um, <clears throat> so. Looking at the sort of um, investment portfolio got to maximise return sometimes does mean not investing in a sector, but it doesn't necessarily. But you do, do need to look at the individual cases behind that. So I, I, I agree with the sort of continuum of uh, looking at um, engagement first like Aegon, but you need to have that back if if, if, not, if nothing happens. Um, and one final suggestion, you talk about what you're talking about, red lines. I've got one. 
suggestion. No more investing in any new coal plants. Quite simple. OK, thanks very much. I'll take one more question. Mr King. Well, it wasn't really a question as such, but it was just really uh, to emphasise the point that in the response on survey, the uh, pension fund member survey, uh, 50% said they didn't know what the fiduciary duty was. 31% said they only knew a little. So to my mind, that's 81% of the people who responded basically haven't got a clue what the fiduciary duty is. I mean, I'll put that in common in parlour. So that, 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 that means there's a complete lack of understanding. Uh, second, on the question about understanding the risk of poor investment performance versus expected performance and the ability to pay future pensions, over a third of people said they didn't understand that link. That's a third of the people who are in the fund, you know, either members or deferred pensioners, etc. That's a very substantial number of people in the fund who basically do not understand that if we make decisions based on the prevailing, you know, uh, direction of travel of, of various things that it could have a very serious impact on the potential future income that they can expect to receive in their pensions in later life. That, that, that to me is very concerning. So I think there's a lot of work to do with the members of the pension fund to explain to them, A, that if you do do things in investment performance that could have an effect on how much they'll get in the future, and B, that we can't just do what they want because there is a legal framework and we have to abide by that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Phil. That's uh, so obviously oh, sorry. Right, Jack, I just you. Can back briefly. Yes, of course, Guy. Um, but yeah, it, it was kind of concerning to us and that's something in the strategy that we've kind of um, tried to emphasise. Um, the fact that, you know, if the investment returns are um, fall in any way, um, that just rise, that just increases the employer contributions. And we also had a few people that were concerned, I guess, their retirement income would be affected. But as a defined benefit scheme, um, that's that's fine. It's just the impact on the employers, which would increase. And obviously that would kind of um, influence your um, your council's spending ultimately. So. Mm -hmm. So so as a leader of one of those councils, I'm not here today as that leader, but I just I'm just going to make the point. It's actually getting to a point where the contributions of employers, some of the employers, if performance of the fund fell below a certain level and the actuarial review said you've got to put more money in to compensate, it'd actually be unaffordable. We wouldn't actually be able to sustain those level of contributions and that in turn would 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 lead to some sort of more fundamental problem. So there are, you know, it is it, it, it these things are all interrelated. So whilst I do understand there are a lot of people who have very strong views and think we should do X, the problem is if we do X, then there's a consequential impact somewhere else, and that is not necessarily what those people and other people would like to see happen. Thank you, Chair. OK, so that's the final question. I think thanks very much, Cap, for the amazing amount of work you put into this. Um, the, uh, I, I think really everybody feels very strongly about climate change. Really, to produce a report that aligns with everybody's opinions is actually quite difficult. So we can't really send you away and say, can you make sure that you, that you align this report with everybody who's been in this room, even though we are only a small percentage of the people there? I think uh, the work that's gone into it is amazing and i really do think there is a lot of work to go ahead on the metrics and uh, it will develop but it, you know there's no doubt at all that uh, I, I certainly believe strongly that there is a challenge for us with climate change probably not for my generation but for future generations and i think everybody in the committee feels ex exactly the same way but uh, thank you for all, all your work on this and your continued work now, uh, we're asked to note the findings of the engagement exercise on the draft targets and measurements to be included in the draft last year pension fund next year of climate strategy. Is that agreed? I noted. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. We will get that. We've said that.
Yeah. So we will get that. You're happy with that? Oh, yeah, that's fine. We asked to approve the draft net zero climate st strategy from consultation. Yeah. Thank you. Is that agreed? Yeah, it is. We were asked to approve the funds response to the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities consultation on the proposals to require to require LGPS administering authorities in England and Wales to assess, manage and report on climate related risks. Is that agreed? Thank you. And finally, we asked to note the quarterly update on stewardship, engagement and voting. Is that agreed? All agreed. Yeah, thanks very much. So we now move on to the climate risk report, uh, which is uh, item eight uh, from pages 131 to 174. So uh, Pat is going to introduce the report, but we're also joined by representatives from LGPS Central, Patrick O'Hara, uh, Baisar Sala and Alex Galbraith. Perhaps you'd move, uh, Sue, to the one on the end there so they can uh, have the centre stage. Yeah, that's a, That's good. That's good. Thank you very much, Sue. Thank you. So they can sit together. Yeah. <laughs> we need some more chairs, I think. Thank you very much for another opportunity to come speak to you about um, our RI efforts and our ESG integration. Um, I've been here before a couple of times, so I've met most of you. I want to introduce a couple of new members to our of our team. Uh, Basha Sally, uh, on the end, he joined the team at the beginning of the year. He's heading up our efforts on ESG integration, our external manager engagement and due diligence work, and the climate risk report that you've seen and we're going to present to you today. And Alex Galbraith has joined the team uh, as an analyst in September. It was full time in September, but I started part time in uh, June, I think it was. And uh, so he's responsible now for producing the reports, uh, uh, providing the analysis around them. Um, so he's going to be presenting today and, and Basha as well. Uh, we've also got a, the scenario analysis that we've included in this year's iteration of the report. Um, and at the end, we're happy to pick up any of points related to the report or any of the topics discussed earlier around our approach to ESG integration and net zero. So I'll I'll switch off now. Thank you very much. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so as Patrick said, I'm part of the team that put together the climate risk report for Let's Year Pension Fund. This is the third report that we've put together. We had a bit of an emphasis this year on looking at the progress you guys have made from 2019, where we first produced the Let's Year Pension Fund climate risk report to uh, what the carbon risk metrics look like in this year. Uh, so the purpose of this presentation is to highlight some of the key findings from the overall report. Uh, so that's going to look at the carbon risk metrics, the climate scenario analysis provided by MRSA, as well as the climate stewardship plan, which falls under the risk management section of the climate risk report. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide. Yep, thank you. Um, so if you look at the table to the right, this shows the total equities and everything that is encompassed within that, including passive equities and active equities. We're going to be focusing on total equities, passive and active, uh, mainly due to the fact that the data coverage within total equities is just a lot more superior to other asset classes. So it allows us to give much more robust findings. Uh, looking at passive and active separately allows us to kind of understand what is driving the carbon risk metric changes in total equities as a whole. Um, if you look to the three squares on the left of the slide, this outlines the carbon risk metrics that we largely focus on in this report. So that's portfolio carbon intensity, which can be best understood as each company will have a carbon intensity, which is simply calculated as the carbon emissions divided by the sales. So this allows us to kind of um, account for sizes of different companies and still compare them from one to the other. For the purposes of looking at funds as a whole and portfolios as a whole, it's best to look at weighted average carbon intensity. So we take the carbon intensities produced by companies and we weight that for the whole fund on the portfolio weight so we can look at a portfolio scale rather than the individual companies. 
Um, next down is exposure to clean technology and fossil fuel reserves. So we've got two different metrics for this. We've got exposure as a whole, which looks at does the company have any exposure whatsoever to fossil fuel reserves, including thermal coal or coal power generation, uh, as well as for clean tech as well. So if there's any exposure whatsoever, we say yes. The portfolio weight of that company will be summed together with the other companies which have any exposure. Uh, the second metric which we've included to kind of overcome the issues that might come of that metric looks at the um, weight of the portfolio appointed by revenue. So uh, it gets a kind of more accurate look at what revenue from all the companies in this portfolio is uh, sourced by fossil fuel reserves and uh, clean tech. Finally is finance emissions. So a very simplistic understanding of finance emissions is to consider this as the emissions that the portfolio of the fund is responsible for. So this is calculated as the emissions of a company uh, apportioned by the portfolio weight as a whole. So if you consider you had 1% ownership of BP, they had you would then be responsible for 1% of their emissions and we aggregate that for all the companies in the portfolio. Um, I should have said at the start, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to stop me at any point. Or if I'm going too fast, just uh, just hang on, Alex. Uh, Malik, we have a question. You take that into account in the final figure. At, at the moment, companies are reporting their absolute emissions. They're not reporting emissions net of offsets. When they do start reporting net of offsets, that's going to be a problem because you can have some companies that are reporting absolute numbers and some companies reporting net of, offset, uh, net of offsets. That's going to be a challenge. The other challenge for us is to make sure that we're comfortable that those offsets are actually robust and do offset the emissions that the company claim they do and that they offset them in perpetuity and this isn't a temporary kind of offset and that the, those offset certificates aren't also being used by somebody else to offset emissions so there's double counting that's a really important job for us as investors to challenge companies on that uh, it's not not a problem yet but it will be a problem definitely thank, thank you Louise. alex carry on please Thank you. Uh, so on the next slide and the second slide of the carbon risk metrics, uh, as I mentioned, we're looking at a comparison from 2019 to 2022. And on the left side of the slide, you can see the uh, carbon portfolio carbon intensity of total equities, active equities, passive equities and the benchmark. So from 2019 to 2022, you can see there's been a significant decrease in the carbon intensity of the total equities. And comparing that to the active equities and passive equities, you can see that that has been largely driven by the decrease in carbon intensity by the passive equities. Um, this change is largely driven by back in 2020, the last year pension fund made the decision to switch from FTSE to FTSE RAFI funds into the LGPS Central Climate Risk um, Climate Multifactor Fund, and that is a large contributor to what has decreased the uh, carbon intensity of passive equities, and which has then passed on to total equities. Um, if you look towards the table in the bottom right, it has the um, top five contributors to portfolio carbon intensity. Um, it adds up to around about 20% and you'll be glad to know that from these five companies, four of them are already in the climate stewardship plan. So they're the companies that we uh, intend to engage with. Um, we'll move on to that a little bit later. And the one company which isn't currently the climate stewardship plan has been recommended to be introduced to the climate stewardship plan from this year. Um, if there's no other questions from this slide, I'm happy to move on to the next one. Thank you. So similar to the slide before, we can see a similar story. So this looks at now the portfolio financed emissions. Uh, we can't include a benchmark for this measurement. Um, 
But as I said, you see a similar story to what we saw from the carbon intensity, while the total equities have seen a significant decrease, again, driven by the passive equities, again, related to the uh, change in portfolio in 2020. Um, if you look towards the table in the top right, <clears throat> so this focuses on the companies with net zero pledges in 2022. So the first uh, row down looks at proportion of total equities. So from the total equities in the portfolio, just shy of 50% of them have a net zero pledge. Uh, that is calculated as the portfolio weight. Uh, moving down to the proportion of companies in material sectors is 50.4%. So this says from the companies in the portfolio, those within material sectors, 50.4% uh, of them have a net zero pledge. And moving on to arguably the most important, the proportion of finance emissions. So from the companies which uh, contribute to finance emissions, 62.5% of those finance emissions are covered by a net zero pledge. And then finally, moving on to the table in the bottom right, similar to the table on the previous page, this looks at the uh, top five companies contributing to the portfolio finance emissions. If you sum up those top fives, you get around 15%. And four of these five are, again, included in the Climate Stewardship Plan. Um, if there's no question on that slide, I'll pass over to Basha to have a look at the climate scenario analysis. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, um, just a couple of quick questions on terminology. Well, one's on terminology. So you're talking about financed emissions. Our main primary target in the draft climate change strategy is talking about absolute emissions. What, what's the difference between those or is it the same? And the second point is around scope three emissions. Um, so when will scope three emissions be included in the, the, the metrics that you're presenting to us? I, mean, I could understand that they're not now, but given the fact that um, you know, the government's consultation consulting on um, uh, a requirement, a legal requirement for local authority pension funds to include scope three emissions in its um, reporting via the TCFD approach. Um, and that could come in as early as April next year. So how would you respond to that in terms of what's happening? Yeah, Thank sure. You. So uh, financed emissions is basically the absolute emissions apportioned to you as an investor based on your ownership of the company. So they are, for all intents and purposes, the, the same thing, because we wouldn't want to track the fact that, you know, Shell have X amount of emissions associated with their business model. We really, really want to know in terms of our portfolio how much of that we're responsible for and, and the direct travel uh, that that's going in. And that's partly down to um, investment decisions around how much you own in the company so you know that's a conversation you can have with your external managers uh, so and it, that that's embedded in the iigcc framework around net zero targets as well as an important omission we added it to the climate risk report this year for that reason on the second point a lot of um scope three emissions data at the moment is estimated and as you can imagine it's a fairly complicated process to estimate and there are def different methodologies that could result in different outcomes. So if you look at the, the downstream emissions, so looking at, let's say, a car manufacturer, looking at their supply chain, if you were trying to model that and work that out, uh, there's a lot of assumptions baked in there. And then their upstream scope three emissions, okay, how many, what are the emissions associated with their cars in use? It depends on who's driving them, how fast they're driving them, how many miles they do in them, a lot of assumptions baked in there. So analysing that information at the moment isn't um, necessarily very fruitful. Now we can get our hands on some estimated data and we will try and integrate that into this next year with some caveats around the quality of the data. But you're, you're right, it is, scope three emissions are very important in many respects in some sectors, they'll dwarf the scope one and two emissions. And they are a very important lens to look at companies through both in terms of the impact of the company, but in terms of your investment risk, because they give a slightly better indication of the challenges the company's business model might face during the transition to a lower carbon economy. Um, I'm glad the government's mandated it because companies might start reporting it now, but there needs to be a consistent methodology around how they do it. Otherwise, 
you're going to get some really um, inconsistent numbers. Thanks very much, Patrick. Right, carry on. Mike. Thank you, Chair. Um, next slide, please. Yep. yep. Um, this is the climate scenario analysis or the strategy section of the report. Um, this is the second time that we have commissioned Mercer to conduct a climate scenario analysis for the fund. The first time being in 2020 um, in our first climate risk report. So um, just to recap what a climate scenario analysis is, it is an exercise where we try to project short, medium and long term climate impact um, of the returns of the funds based on several scenarios. Um, and the impact is measured against a baseline, which is the normal expected return of the fund. Uh, for this purpose, Mercer have used three scenarios. Rapid, which is the, the green line, orderly, which is the yellow line, and uh, the fail scenario, which is the red line. So rapid scenario is characterized by uh, uncoordinated and sudden actions from um, governments and companies. Actions like um, carbon tax uh, or mandate to use certain technologies. Um, so what happened is that if you can think about it, if a, comp if a government suddenly issues a carbon tax to a company, you can expect the return or asset price of this company to, to be affected because cash flow is affected. So in the short term, you'll see an impact to the company, but over the long term, you won't see much impact from the physical risk of climate, climate change because we have successfully transitioned into 1.5 degree scenario. On the orderly uh, scenario, it is more coordinated, so you won't really see the transition impact in the short term because the governments are working together to, to make um, climate change um, to get to 1.5 degrees, but as a result, we are a little bit slower to get to 1.5 degrees, so there's a little bit, just a slightly higher impact on physical risk over the long term. And field scenario is really government and companies not doing anything at all on climate change. So in the short term, you see that you will get some additional economic profit because you know the fossil fuel companies can keep on pumping on a gas from 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 the ground, but over the long term, you'll see more physical impact from climate change, from you know floods, natural disasters, and stuff like that, which has a significant impact to asset prices. And as you can see here. Uh, which I'll talk about in conclusion one, um, the impact on the red line is about 30% from the baseline. So um, from this analysis, Mercer came up with four conclusions, which is really related to each other. Um, the con key conclusion number one is basically this chart here. Uh, as you can see, yellow and green lines, which are the basically the transition um, scenarios the successful transition scenarios delivers better results um, simply because Mercer thinks that quite a bit of the transition risks have already been pressed in and the big impact to portfolio returns is over the long term physical risk. And as I mentioned earlier in the failed scenario, the impact to the portfolio return could be as high as 30 or 40 percent. And key conclusion two is we go down to the asset level class. Similarly, um, you want in the short term when it's when you're ex you're exposed to transition risk, the sustainable asset classes like sustainable equity and sustainable private equity gives you a little bit of protection from that transition risk. Um, as you can imagine, if a carbon tax is being being um, announced by a government, these are the companies which are not so affected. Uh, and over the longer term, the growth assets, basically assets which returns are generated from the growth of the asset uh, of the asset price over long term would be more affected in the long term. So um, the third 
the third conclusion is just going down further one level on sector and region. Similar to um, asset class level, you get better protection in the short term from transition assets. So um, renewable energy, renewable um, assets, uh, low carbon electricity generation, those are assets which gives you a little bit of protection from um, transition risk. Uh, and on the contrary, on the other, uh, on the other, at the end of the scale, fossil fuels, when when government actually announced carbon tax, for example, they will be the most affected by it. And key conclusion four is to sum up everything. Um, as an investor, we have to be more aware of all these risks because um, as illustrated here, the impact could be as high as 30, 40% to the portfolios over long term. So um, just we have to look at asset allocation and be aware of what could happen to the asset prices over long term and make our decision um, accordingly. Um, I think that's it for the climate scenario analysis. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take. I would just emphasize that for me, the key message from, the, from this is that you can see that the failed scenario is a much worse outcome for us as investors than the 1.5 degree scenarios, the orderly disorderly scenarios. So that suggests that it's fully in keeping with our fiduciary responsibility to try and bring out bring about the 1.5 degree or well below two degree outcome uh, and that is a way of protecting investment returns over the longer term thank you patrick uh, i mean i i think everybody feels very strongly about this less you know the local pension funds government funds it is significant but there is also the need for worldwide for this to be taken. You know, it isn't just the responsibility of the local. We are doing what we, what, exactly what we have said we're going to do, and I think it's great that we are, but uh, that there are many other aspects as well. And that, sorry. I'm just interested in, in conversation that we've had earlier in terms of, um, I like this word blending that Aegon used around wider ESG. Um, and there is a risk that I'm perceiving at the moment around what I call a green veil, um, in that there could be lots of other things going on in these investments that, uh, you know, may be ethically questionable in other ways. Um, you know, for instance, I know of a company that um, makes um, solar panels, sells them to an African government, but those solar panels are then put on the roofs of the army that then persecutes the people of that country. Um, and so how, how do we mitigate against those sorts of activities? Uh, when we do invest in those um, sorts of projects, it's normally through our private markets um, division within LGPS Central, and we do due diligence on all of those deals. And, and this has been a subject of controversy because just because something is on paper green, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do proper and robust due diligence. So whoever we're investing via, we ask them what due diligence they've done on supply chain issues like that. You know, we've, we've, we're well aware of supply chain issues around solar panels and particularly when most of them are being manufactured in China. So we do look into that and, and in a more holistic way to try and a, get comfort that the manager that we're partnering with takes these things very seriously and has the same conviction around them as we do, but also that they have the capability to do something about it. So they've done the research and analysis. So we try and challenge them as, as hard as we hard as we can. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. So. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think this is a very interesting report containing a lot of detailed information. And what I'd like to know is how our... Uh, fund managers use this information in making decisions uh, to either challenge or invest or uh, not invest in, in companies that are listed, for example, in on page 167 of the report. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that, there are, this speaks to some of the conversations that have happened earlier. Our requirement of all our managers or across all of our asset classes is it to integrate ESG considerations into their investment processes. So by the time the portfolio is constructed, they should have already identified those companies that they're not prepared to invest in, which is why you see you don't see Exxon in our active portfolios, but you do see Shell. So in terms of divestment, even before 
you know, we talk about what's in the portfolio, there has been a process of assessment of those companies and the, and full and robust uh, analysis should have been conducted at identifying all of the material risks. They should also have confidence in management in terms of the, the disclosure and, uh, and the management's ability to, to manage the transition. So that, that's one uh, element of that. We also require, we require them to report to us on a quarterly basis. We have quarterly meetings where we scrutinise them. And they use a reporting system not dissimilar to Agon's. There's lots of variations out there where they will rate the companies. They have a scale. It's almost like a credit rating scale. It runs from AAA to C, and C are the laggards and AAA are the leaders. Now, there's, no, there's nothing stopping them in investing in a laggard, particularly if they felt that the laggard was improving and that was going to result in an enhancement of returns or an enhancement in the financial aspects of the of the abilities of the uh, company's performance um you know there has been research done that static esg ratings are not as um insightful in terms of predicting investment performance as improving ratings so it's when the ratings are deteriorating or improving when they become most closely correlated with performance. That's one piece of research that found that. Um, so they have to justify to us why they, this company has got through their ESG process. And we pick out companies that have challenged business models around climate change or other ESG issues, including supply chain management, human rights. Um, so they are required to integrate that into the investment making uh, investment the, the investment process and the decision making around the investment. Okay, thanks very much. So, um, do we have any other questions before we carry on? Okay. So, next we can take a look at the climate stewardship plan. So, I'll just quickly talk you through this table and then we'll take a closer look at some of the companies actually within the climate stewardship plan. So, going from left to right, it has the company, the sector that this company operates in, if this company is in the active, passive, or both uh, funds, and then the climate action 100 plus. So Climate Action 100 produced 10 categories and provides scores on these categories. The categories are ranging from uh, capital allocation, short term net zero goals, long term net zero goals. And from this, they have several measurements within each category where they will provide scores on the category as a whole. So you can say that for each category, you've met all the criteria, you've met none of the criteria or you've met some of the criteria. And that is for all of the 10 categories. Um, next along is the engagement objectives and what we hope to achieve out of the engagement with these companies. Following that is the strategy of our engagement. And then we have the TPI management quality and the TPI carbon performance. So looking at uh, CEMEX, which is the bottom on there, just to outline some of the engagement we've had with them, we've been able to, uh, since we started engaging with them, uh, CEMEX have appointed a senior executive in the position of Vice President of Sustainability and released a, the company's first integrated report. Um, during 2020, uh, CEMEX had the target to deliver net zero concrete by 2050. Uh, they also announced it's, re uh, it's able to reduce carbon intensity by 22% since 1990. And then looking at the Climate Action 100 plus scores, um, they've seen quite a lot of improvements from this year to last. So during uh, 2021, um, they met none of the criteria in three of the categories and in none of the categories did they meet all of the criteria. Uh, to this year, they've improved such that they have met uh, excuse me, sorry. Um, so they met none of the criteria only in one category and in four categories, all the criteria was met. Um, see, I'll, uh, if we can move on to the next slide and I'll pass over to Fasha to discuss. Sure. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, now we have eight companies on on the list here um, over three over the three slides, but that doesn't mean um, 
we only engage with all the, the eight companies. We obviously engage with a lot more companies. Um, and by next year, we recommended Linda to, to be added to this list. So hopefully it's going to be nine or even more companies if needs be. Um, if you look at our engagement um, that we've done over the past year or so, uh, I know there's a discussion about financial sector just now, and if you look at LGBT Central, what we have done, we have engaged quite a lot with financial sectors, and um, we did uh, we did file or co-file several climate um, resolutions at AGMs um, of financial sector companies, Barclays in the previous few years and Credit Suisse this year, so uh, there is an engagement on financial sector. But um, I'm moving on to back to the climate stewardship plan. Um, I'll speak about Glencore because Glencore is a company that we directly engage as a co-lead um, of the Climate Action 100 group. Uh, we have had a lot of constructive discussion with the company managed at management and at board level. And we have been able to extract um, several improvements from the companies, one of it being the short term and medium term um, climate targets that they have announced. Previously, it was 40% um, reduction by 2035. This year, we managed to get them to increase the ambition to 50% by 2035, and they added a 15% reduction by 2026 target. Um, so that is an improvement. They've also um, They've also uh, cut ties with several um, trade associations. Uh, I think it was Mineral Councils of Australia being one of it. Um, having said that, we still voted against this uh, climate progress report this year at the AGM, and we've made our decision public uh, through a press release on our website as well as circular to other Climate Action 100 members. The reason why we did so is um, several, and we think that um, voting is one of a key tool for our engagement to escalate issues with the management of companies. And with this um, decision to go public with our vote, what happened afterwards was that there have been a lot more constructive um, discussion with the company. So hopefully, if we come back here next year, We'll be able to show more greens on the pie chart as opposed to yellow and greens. Um, that's it for Glencore. Let's move on to the final slide on climate stewardship plan. Um, there's two two more companies here, Shell and Taiwan Semi. Um, oops. Next one. Yep, this is it. Um, yeah, so we have Shell and Taiwan Semi. Uh, if you see Taiwan Semi or TSMC, there, there's no results for Climate Action 100 and there's no results for TPI. The reason being um, Climate Action 100 picks the top 100 emitters in the world and it's now 170-ish companies, but Taiwan Semi is not one of it there because they don't really um, emit that much, but they are an important uh, part of our emerging markets portfolio as it is with any emerging markets portfolio. So they tend to be up there as one of the top contributors of work, uh, carbon intensity or one of the top emitters of finance emission by virtue of them being a heavyweight in the, in the portfolio. Um, with TPI, they tend to look at it from a sector perspective. So semiconductor or foundries are not included in the analysis just yet. Um, hopefully this will change in the future. But that doesn't mean we don't engage with TSMC. Um, we do. We have EOS at Federated Hermes as our stewardship partner, and they engage with TSMC on several climate issues, such as the, the use of renewable energy in their manufacturing facilities, as well as their water use, which is a key issue for a foundry. Uh, and they have been quite a bit of progress. They are now reporting on TCFD, one of the earlier 
emerging market companies to do so, and they they have announced several renewable energy targets in their manufacturing facilities, which we are tracking. So, yeah. Thank you. You're tracking the targets. Are you tracking the actions as well? Yes. Um, we try to escalate it. Um, if you look at how we voted last, um, I'll just give an example of how we voted. In 2021, um, which is the first years where companies start to announce climate action plan and um, put them to vote to, to shareholders, we didn't have any clue, so we voted pretty much anything that looks to be aligned with um, uh, 1.5 degree scenario. And this year, what happened is that we look at every single plan more thoroughly. So we have, uh, well, just like TPI sector based, so there's a, a pathway to 1.5 degrees. And if the companies plan are not aligned with that, we will vote against and we have voted against pretty much all of the climate plans um, put forward by companies this year because we don't see any which are aligned with a strict 1.5 degree scenario. Um, next year, we, I would assume we will escalate our, uh, we will ratchet up our expectation. We will, we will have to look at progress to, to these plans as well. So. Uh, yeah, um, we have tools that we use to actually track this. Um, one of it being Net Zero Zeal is it is a it is an app which is uh, developed by a professor from University College Dublin, where, where he used the AI to track um, the climate action plans of companies and the progress of these um, uh, companies to their own plan uh, to their own pledges. So we use that tool as long as as well as you know the TPI scores and the CA100 scores to form our vote voting, um, and we will continue to escalate uh, going forward. Can I just add something? Just before we move on, um, could you send me a link uh, to the app? Yeah, we can send okay. you. I think the uh, app is probably uh, exaggerating it, but it it uh, we can send you copies of the analysis. You've got it. Yeah. And we can put you in touch with the professor as well. He's more than happy to speak about it as probably most oh, professors are. Okay, thanks very much for that. We are asked to note the climate change uh, climate risk report. Is that agreed? Yeah, agreed. We are also asked to approve the recommendations and actions and considerations set out in paragraph 42 for inclusion within the fund's responsible investment plan. Is that agreed? All agreed? Yep. Yeah. OK, thank you very much, Bashar, uh, Alex and Patrick for coming along and explaining in great detail what you have done and uh, it's great work. Thank you. So the next item is the uh, pension fund valuation uh, indicative whole fund results. Uh, so Ian Howe Pension Fund Manager is going to present this report and Richard Warden from Hyman's has joined us online, I hope. He doesn't look as though he's there at the moment. Oh, he's there. Yes, he is. Oh, good morning, Richard. So, uh, Ian. Where's Ian? Going? Thank you, Chair. Oh, there he is. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, all. Um, the purpose of the report is to inform committee of the indicative whole fund results and the proposed change to the CPI assumption. We provided the um, assumptions, the original assumptions to committee in June this year and to the board in August. Um, we have kept those under review and given the recent financial uncertainty, we are proposing a change to the CPI assumption. Um, since August, uh, we've been discussing this with, with Hyman's and, and Richard will, will talk that through in terms of why we're proposing a change from 2.7 to 2.9 CPI for, for the assumption. But before I pass over to Richard, if I may, I'd just like to talk about the whole fund results as well. 
we've had the whole fund results through from from Richard and colleagues at, at Hyman's. In 2019, at the previous valuation, the fund was 89% funded. The 2022 valuation using the 2.9% CPI, so the higher CPI, we've increased to 105% funded, which is a, a, rem a remarkable improvement and, and a really good, good result. A lot of that has been driven by investment return over those three years. It's important to note that we are we're looking at this a long term, it's a long term funding um, view and we shouldn't react quickly to now being overly funded. So we, we need to work carefully in terms of the, how that result uh, moves through into the employer individual results, which will follow at the end of November into very early December. And I'll be working through those when I receive them in the next two to three weeks time. But what I would like to say is with the, the fund result at 105%, some of the employers will be significantly, significantly funded um, over the 120% funding target, which is where we're aiming for. So there'll be some that will be over 120% funded. And we're looking at a mechanism which is in the funding strategy statement, which is actually as a document attached in the next report um, to explain how we could to, to, to effectively give some of those contributions back to those employers, but in a stepped, sensible way and not, not too quickly, because if you give contributions back too fast or, or too highly, then we don't want to get into a position where we're then in the next valuation trying to then recoup those contributions again. But it's it's a good, it is a good, good outcome. It's a it's a good position. So unless there's any or if there are any questions, I'll happily take those now and then I'll pass over to Richard on the CPI. Okay. Has, has anybody got any questions on on Nick? Yes. Thanks, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. It's a, it's a very fair point indeed. This this these these results are at the 31st of March 22, and the point you make is exactly right. Thank you, Nick. So, Richard, over to you. Okay, thank you. We can he hope you can hear me okay. Uh, yeah. So, I think it's fair to say inflation. Well, even before we looked at this inflation assumption again, uh, as Ian mentioned, uh, inflation expectations were up since or have been rising since 2019 so we had this assumption of uh 2.7 which just to to, to to stress that's a average over a 20 year period and uh, the shape of it is high in the short term and lower over the longer terms it trends towards the bank of england target which is still currently two percent uh, per annum for cpi i think it's fair to say in summary uh what's happening interesting enough egon mentioned this earlier on we are seeing higher inflation expectations and it's been increasing over the last few months. So kind of higher for longer is the theme. So we still expect it will trend downwards over the longer term, but it will take a bit longer, we think, uh, compared to where we were uh, at, at March, which as you mentioned, is a snapshot. And it's still a highly uncertain thing. And the reason we think that there's lots of indicators out there suggest inflation is is going for is, is going up. One of the ones that tends not you don't see in the headlines, you tend to see CPI or RPI in the headlines, but there's something called core inflation. Now core inflation is where you strip out food costs and energy costs. So these are the things that have been driving up CPI and RPI. Even when you when you strip out that that gives you a better indication of what's happening out there with things like wages and, and other areas of inflation and that's been going up steadily over uh, the last few months so uh, that's one uh, strong indicator we're seeing a lot of upwards wage pressures you're, you're seeing a lot of strikes being reported now and uh, demands from employees to get to get higher and that will of course and push up inflation too and of course we just uh, uh, in september the september cpi which is a thing that gets used typically to set the pension increase order for next year that applies to all the benefits in the fund it was, it was at 10.1 percent and it's just been reported at the end for the October CPI, the 12 months to October, it's gone up even further 
to 11.1%. So it's running at a really high rate at the moment. We haven't seen that for, I think it's about 40 years since we saw inflation uh, of that, that sort of uh, size. Awesome statement, obviously, was yesterday. Interest enough, OBR forecasts have gone up a bit. So they're suggesting that next year it will be 7.4. Sounds like a very accurate number, and I think we all recognise it could be higher or lower than that. But, you know, nonetheless, OBR are pushing up their forecasts as well. Uh, and that was a big a big thrust of that statement yesterday to try to control inflation. inflation. Uh, another thing that was interesting about yesterday, uh, I think, was that the... There's quite a big focus on protecting benefits, so state pension and other types of benefits with inflation. There had been a bit of talk before the Austin statement about, well, maybe this is a time where uh, the Treasury perhaps use a lower increase next year for pension funds. But it seems the direction of travel is we'll probably stick with inflation next year for this pension increase order. So we think it's probably more likely now than it was before that, that uh, you know, uh, a 10.1% increase will be applied to pension increases across the board uh, in 2023 in the fund and the wider LGPS. So I, I, won't, I won't go on to I appreciate you've had a really busy agenda. Uh, and maybe just a final point about how we manage this inflation risk. So, you know, it's something we need to keep a handle on and then try to monitor and control it to the extent that the fund can, you know, do something to mitigate the risk. Uh, one point, I suppose, is you do invest in real assets. A lot of the assets are real in the fund. In other words, you'd expect with higher inflation to get inflation-linked returns over the long term, certainly. So you've got a bit of protection there in your assets. Um, this inflation protection margin that Ian mentioned, that's another way of protecting, protecting, getting, you know, build it into liabilities and into the contribu contribution rate setting process. And when we do evaluation, and Ian mentioned we're doing employer results at the moment, and so we do stress test those results across different economic scenarios. So some of those scenarios will have periods where actually inflation is higher for longer than, than the kind of consensus view. So we do try to stress test that to make sure that we're being sufficiently prudent to cover those times and scenarios where perhaps inflation is higher for longer. And the final point was we're going to do some work with officers on liquidity and cash flow. So it's really important that obviously when benefits go up, puts more pressure on income in the pension fund to make sure you've got enough liquid money simply to pay the benefits as they fall due. So uh, we're doing some work in that and talking to officers and that will be, I think, coming to, to committee uh, early next year. So I'll just, I'll, I'll stop at that point. Cause it's, Thanks, yeah. uh, Richard. Has anybody got any questions, Nick? Talk about the Treasury um, sort of looking about uh, changing the inflation assumption. What scope do they really have to actually change the inflation assumption? Um, I know that when there was the challenge to the RPI CPI change, that there was a court case that the government won, but the court actually said that the government could change the inflation assumption, that the uplift, but only when it was rational. So that therefore, if it wanted to change it to say CPIH, then they could do that. But I'm not sure that it, they would be legally allowed to um, just look an arbitrary figure. Or, or yeah. am I wrong on that? Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, we've been looking closely at this because we have to lay in Parliament this thing called a pension increase order. It's under legislation. You have to now. Actually, as it happens, historically, it's been pretty much always linked to. Well, as you mentioned, RPI many moons ago changed to CPI. They got challenged, but that challenge failed because the gov government has got quite a lot of control over this. Right, so we think they can change. They could reduce to ten point one to another number if they so felt the case. Because I think they control that legislation. It's in the government's remit remit to do that. Just an example, and this is a different scenario, but don't you remember a few years ago there was deflation one year? You might you might recall, I think yep. it was minus 0.1 or something yep. or minus 0.2. And the government, actually the flip side, they said, listen, we're not going to reduce benefits. We'll just, you know, I think it was a flat, they just said we'll freeze at the time or something. Uh, so we do we do have the power to go up or down in this. I think, I think we do have the power to change from a 10.1, but it seems like we're going to stick with this 10.1 if you believe the direction of travel yesterday from that autumn statement on, on state benefits and other public sector benefits like the LGPS. There could be another legal challenge. But ah, well, it could be, there could be. <laughs> okay, thanks, Nick. So, um, 
we are asked um, to um, we are asked to approve a rise in the last year pension fund CPI assumption from 2.7 to 2.9 percent. Is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, we're also asked to note the indicative whole fund valuation result as at the 31st of March 2022 was 105 percent funded. Is that agreed? Yep. Yeah. Agreed. OK, so we're on to item 10, um, funding strategy statement, investment strategy statement and investor advisor objectives set out on pages 215 to 296. Ian is going to take us through the first part of the report and then we're going to ask Bulash to conclude with the second part of the report. So over to you, Ian. Thank you again, Chair. Um, as part of the valuation, um, we have to consult with all the employers and one of those elements is on the funding strategy statement because that is effectively the information that sits behind the way that the, the, the contributions for the employers and, and the, 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 the processes that we work through, that's the sort of the Bible, that's the information that sits behind it. And we have a funding strategy statement that we review regularly it doesn't have it's not it's not just done every three years it's evaluation it's done more regularly and um, so we've taken the opportunity to review the funding strategy statement and that will go out with the employer um, indicative results in in late November early December so I've taken the opportunity to bring this through to to the to committee to update you I've, I've done um, a sort of a highlight of the, the 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 changes. There aren't really any significant changes. There's only really one. Um, but what we've done is we've taken the opportunity to sort of review the layout and the style of it to just to make it an easier document to work through. Um, the key the key change that is within the funding strategy statement for the consultation with the employers is the point we've just talked about in the earlier report for those employers that are over the 120% funded. It's a, it's a situation that we didn't have at the last valuation because we were at a much lower funding position. But because we've improved so significantly on the funding, some of the employers are going to be the over those 120 percent funded. So we, we've we put a matrix in the in the funding strategy statement and that will allow us to talk to the employers to to to, to understand their kind of concerns or their thoughts, their 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 comments. And we'll take that forward. The other changes I wasn't going to suggest, I go through line by line. They're simply really just tidying up things we already do, and we're just now making them more explicit in the funding strategy statement. Happy to take any questions before I hand over to Bulash on the other two parts. Yeah, no, no, no. Right, so nobody's got any questions, so Bulash, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Nine and ten are a bit of background for um, the investment strategy statement. So all LGPS funds in England and Wales are required to have an investment strategy statement. The last update to this document was uh, approved by the Pension Committee in February 2021. We have a uh, minor updates annually and a, a bigger update um, every three years. Um, on 217, page 217.11 talks about four, four areas that uh, we're going to quickly run through. Um, 11A, um, an update to the investment beliefs to include explicit reference to climate change presenting a material risk to financial markets. Um, this is all in addition to the, uh, the responsible investment belief that existed previously. B um, is an update to the 2022 SAA, which was approved at the January meeting of the, the local pension committee. So the strategic asset allocation that we review once a year has been updated in this document. Um, by the time we've finished consultation on the ISS and it comes back in March, we'll have hopefully been to another January SAA meeting and we'll update the table again. Um, for reference, if anybody does want to have a look on page 277, we do have the, um, the SAA that was approved back in January. Um, 11C um, is the introduction of a rebalancing policy within the ISS. So this is the first time we've had a, a formal policy. It was one of the uh, recommendations of 2022 even um, and it it's it's there to um, give us a kind of framework to to decide when to rebalance and what we've done is we've we've got our our asset classes um, grouped into three groups so we've got a growth group a uh, an income group and a protection group that you'll probably be familiar with by now 
and we've said that or at least proposed that if the growth group is uh, plus or minus two and a half percent of its midpoint weight so the midpoint weight for growth is a uh, 55.25 percent of total fund assets if we deviate from that plus or minus two and a half we'll look into uh, rebalancing that best we can we've got similar tolerances around the income part at plus or minus two percent and then um, for protection plus or minus one percent um the rebalancing framework does give us a bit of scope uh, to exercise judgment given markets and individual asset classes can be sometimes more volatile than others and uh, fund may not or may want to exercise additional caution and or due diligence before making any automatic rebalancing decisions um, where we are outside those tolerances and we decide not to make a change that will be reported to the next committee as well um, point d there on page 218 is just an update on a matter of fact we've got um an update to the mean long-term return of the portfolio moving to six and a half percent per annum from 5.5 um, as part of the triennial fund valuation exercise. Point 13, um, moving on to investor advisor objectives. So we're, we're required to have objectives for our investment management. Um, you'll note that Hyman's Robertson are the fund's investment manager, uh, sorry, the investment advisor. Um, point, point 14 talks to the number of changes that we've made um, at this review 15a and um, so we've said changes within the strategic objectives to propose advice that will maintain a long-term steady state of full funding going forward and inclusion of suitable diversification statements taking into account the funds governance capacity and focus on predictable returns um, the, the other changes, uh, changes within the governance objectives that include advice on actions the fund should undertake to deliver its net zero goals and other RI objectives and priorities. Um, the last point on there is uh, to propose a consultation on both the ISS and FSS, like Ian has mentioned, um, and to assist administration. Both will commence at the same time the employees receive their indicative employer rates, which is expected to be late November. Um, and we expect this consultation to run to mid-January. Um, any questions for either of those two areas? So, any questions for anyone? No, it doesn't look as though we have uh, any questions. So, um, we are asked to approve the last year pension fund draft funding strategy statement for consultation. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. Uh, oh, second, we are asked to approve the last year pension fund draft investment statement strategy for consultation. Is agreed? Yep. Finally, we ask to approve the fund's investment advisors' investment objectives submission to the Competition and Market Authority. Is that agreed? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. So we're on now to uh, agenda item 11, the pension fund policy report as set out on pages 297 to 308. Uh, again, Ian, you're presenting this report, so over to you. Thank you again, Chair. This is a report that basically details all of the policies that the fund has, and it just provides a sort of a timetable showing when each of those need to be next reviewed. We've already discussed a number of them, as you can see, and their review date is November this year. But the, the key point I particularly wanted to point out on this report is a new policy on cyber, a cyber security policy. We have been doing cyber security within the pension fund, but we haven't had a specific policy. So we've prepared that and it's good governance for having so. And it's one of the pension regulators requirements. So this is hence why we're taking it to, to um, yourselves today. So the new policy outlines the fund's approach to cyber risk. It's been developed in conjunction with the County Council security officers. And we've also done quite a lot of work with our providers of systems, particularly Haywoods. Haywoods are the administration system provider. We've checked their policies, um, as have our security um, officers, and we've put together the, the attached policy that's shown in the appendix. Um, we've, we've taken a lot of advice in this area, in truth, because hands in, hand on heart, pensions officers aren't cyber security officers, to be honest. So we have taken a lot of advice in this area. <laughs> um, but but it, on, in honest truth, a lot of the information has been developed from the County Council and we've just used that for our own, our own purpose. But the specific key point is the work we've done with Haywoods, the system provider. 
the the policy is attached as an appendix we took it through to the board prior to bringing this to yourselves as well um, and they 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 had no comments so i'm happy to take any questions but if they're too technical i might have to come back to you <laughs> okay nick uh, I, I noticed talk about it's right right to pr bring this in um, do we have a policy to say that we would like mrs thatcher we would never pay a ransom it would we are sort of um exclude on legal grounds one might want to expand but i know we it's sort of proceeds of crime sort of thing we can't sort of pay ransoms so that's that's sort of county council's full stop okay yeah would it be a good idea to put that in i don't know no, it doesn't do any harm. It's a bit like enough fraud ones we put. We've got a zero yeah. tolerance. We always prosecute. So okay. it's in line with that. Yeah. OK. Right. So if there are no any uh, further, any comments? Yeah, Phil. Yeah. So I've got a couple of questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, so just going into the uh, use of passwords uh, in Section 7C of the report, page 306, 307. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about this because it says there's no expiry date on, and I know this is talking about staff, but it says there's no expiry date on the password. So presumably when somebody leaves, the password is, the account is blocked and the password is then expired. But why isn't there any expiry date on passwords? Surely there should be a regular turnover of passwords in case someone's divulging passwords or in case the passwords do get hacked. Um, equally, why is there nine, nine attempts for password retry I mean, I, to be honest, I didn't know county policy was 10. That that does seem to me excessive uh, to have that many re-attempts on a password. Uh, and, you know, you know, why do you need, you know, nine or 10, 10 goes at it? OK, thank you. Thank good, you. Good questions. Um, and I would probably have to honestly revert back to our IT security colleagues to, to provide some of the answers to these, because most of this information has come from. Sure our internal IT and um, I'm, I'm afraid I, I probably. Yeah, look, we'll we'll so come back to you with an answer on that, Phil. I'm just going to say just to give a bit of comfort, obviously we'll come back on the specifics, but it's kind of they do follow, I suppose, the industry best practice and it does keep changing. So you, you're absolutely right. It used to be best practice that people would change the password regularly. Then probably I think it was a couple of years ago. I think that the industry realised that people were writing it down or making them too easy to remember. So then it flipped to have a more complex kind of one that you don't change. But I think we're, we absolutely need to come back to you with a with the proper answer. But it is that sort of what industry advice is does change. OK, so if there are no further questions, uh, we're asked to approve the pension fund cyber policy. Is that agreed? Yeah, that's everybody. Thank you. So we're on to the summary evaluation of the pension fund, uh, item 12, uh, investment performance of individual managers and investment advisors, starting at page 309. Uh, Declan is going to introduce this report. Thank you, Chair. So just first of just draw your attention to the table in sort of paragraph two, that nice multicoloured one. And I think last time when I presented this report sort of three months ago, I sort of commented how sort of you couldn't even tell if sort of the impact that we'd had of COVID sort of that, had, that you know, driven a truck through sort of financial markets and everything looked really calm. And and now kind of the opposite's true. The whole the table looks a bit of sort of a, a mess and it's been kind of quite remarkable sort of the, the turmoil sort of the that's sort of driven. And these are sort of obviously general market figures, that it, but it's even affecting the kind of the 10 year numbers, which is which is quite unusual, but does give a sense of the extent of the kind of the, the change. And, and it's likely we're going to kind of continue to see sort of quite sort of quite a bit of turmoil because the kind of the, the I suppose the global economy is doing, going through quite a transition at the moment. It's moving from a very low interest rate, low inflation, highly globalised sort of in, environment to basically the, the potentially sort of the, the reverse of that. So it is likely we're going to see sort of quite a bit of noise through this and, and those numbers probably not settling for a, for a little bit of time. The, well, so I was going to pick up paragraph 29 was the next one I was just going to sort of highlight in terms of the, um, let's find it. In terms of the targeted return, obviously it's kind of, um, it's one that's been sort of working with Central, Bullish has been very much working with Central over the sort of the, the last sort of 12, 18 months. And the, the product that they're sort of the developing is a, is a very complex um, 
at least as it were in target return isn't one that a lot of funds go into we have done it here and it's served us really really well you'll see we've seen later in the report in terms of those returns and in, in times of kind of quite a lot of volatility uh, but because of the complexity of the product that sort of central is coming up with what we decided to do is wait until after the strategic asset allocation because it's only around the, the corner in january where hymans are having a bit more of a look in light of sort of some of the other things that are going on about what's the right setup and then we'll reappraise it in that in in that sort of in the round as it were so so that'll be a bit later than originally we sort of we we said to committee it was going to going to be just so we get it right because it'd be quite a it'd be quite a difficult transition the next one i was going to pick up was on paragraph 34 there's just a little summary table there which is quite neat and you can, again you can see the sort of some of that volatility sort of feeding through into the actual sort of the funds performance it's not as bad as kind of the the wider market table above partly because there's obviously sort of offsetting things within there partly because we have kind of things that go the, the other way target return I just mentioned has been quite good infrastructure has been very good in here as well in terms of helping both that sort of fund performance and the and the long-term performance you'll notice as well the kind of the three year at 5.3 percent does give us the returns we need for the valuation now there is a little bit dangerous looking at three years when our valuation target returns are based over sort of a 20-year period but it does give that faith as well we've kind of we've been through a pretty horrible kind of year in terms of financial returns but the diversification of the fund is good enough to to kind of see us through that might not always do that but it is kind of you know it's better to be in this position than than not as it as it were in terms of the uh, the report then goes into sort of the, the managers that perform well and not so well this this quarter and you'll you'll see again i've touched on it a couple of times it's target return aspect in in particular um, you will notice it, it might seem counterintuitive. We've trimmed off aspect a, a little bit, and the reason we've done that is because they've they've performed so well, but they are a very very volatile manager. In, in years gone by, we've been sort of you know sort of scratching their heads as they've sort of dropped twenty percent in a quarter. So they do fire up and down. So we we have taken the opportunity to to bank some of their some of their gains. Uh, Timber also did well, and it was interesting. We, we, it wasn't that long ago we had Stafford in, and they did talk about kind of the. Um, they're not necessarily sort of correlated to to equities and the sort of that that ability that trees continue to grow even if the economy is kind of stalling. So you know it's heartening that timber sort of doing what it it needs to do as well with sort of less sort of an intrinsic link to the the economy. In terms of the sort of the, the negative kind of column, as it were, it's the it's the debt managers and you know you heard a little bit from Aig on those with short dated so not as big an impact, but some of the stuff has has got absolutely kind of. Uh, hammered you know Hagen as well particularly the sort of the index linked as opposed to the, uh, the sort of the short term one and it again it's following the, the market a bit of concern there that some of our managers have performed much worse in the market and you do hope that active managers do do better when sort of in times of volatility or downturn that hasn't been the the case we'll have to see, again we'll have to see the how the dust settles but we've got um central coming into the uh to our january meeting so we be a good opportunity so i'll talk to them about you know what their expectation of managers why the performance has kind of fallen away from what we'd normally expect and that was all i was going to touch on by way of introduction chair have to take any comments or questions okay thank you has anybody got any questions or comments no all right so uh we are asked to note the valuation of the fund is that agreed yep thank you um, so we're now on to uh, agenda item 13, pensions fund update, budget 22-23, LGPS Central Joint Committee and Annual General Meeting. This is uh, this item is over pages 327 to 334. It is proposed that we take this report as read. Unless anyone has any questions, is that agreed? Yeah, agreed. Thank you. The next item is the risk management internal controls. Uh, as set out on pages 335 to 356. Again, it's proposed that we take this report as read unless anyone has any questions. Is that agreed? Okay, go on, Jeff. So if this re refers to the risk register, doesn't it? Is that yes, it does, yeah. 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 I've been um, sort of storing up this question for quite some time now with can <laughs> council's meetings and um, et cetera. But, but anyway, um, no, I mean, I think um, my concern is really over the, the highest risk. Um, so if, if I'm looking now, just to tell you which page I'm looking at, which is the actual risk, risk register itself on page 340. So uh, if we go on to just a bit, a couple of, well, yeah, so risk, risk number three, investments. So failure to take account of all risks to future investment returns within the setting of asset allocation, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, so that's got a risk of 12. I think I'm right in saying unless um, any office can, can say that this the risk register has been updated a lot recently. But um, my, my real concern is that um, yeah, there are some significant risks that we've discussed and, and highlighted indeed in the climate risk report that we've received. Um, um, and we've discussed with Aegon and when we were talking about the climate risk report with LGF, LGFS Central, you know, there is the potential and the, probably the reality for, you know, fossil fuel like our companies to fail to transition to their business to renewables. And I just kind of feel that, you know, well, I feel this is a very, very real risk, and but I'm not seeing it stated explicitly in the risk register, and I kind of feel like it really should be, and there should be some, you know, there should be more con specific controls stated here. It says we're developing, you know, obviously we're developing climate change strategy, which obviously we know that that's happening, but, um, you know, I, I feel because in my mind and a lot of our minds, you know, high ESG risk e equals high financial risks. So in terms of the risk register for the, the, the pension fund, um, you know, I feel there needs to be more explicit statement and of what the what the consequent causes and consequences are and what and what we're doing about it, 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 it more clearly stated in the risk register. And I'm being interested in when officers could reassure me on that. I think you're right there, Jeff. I think we're going to have a, 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 a bigger review over the investments piece. We've got um, a lot of work going on at the minute, you know, notwithstanding the, the climate risk report, um, the draft strategy, plus a, a review of the strategic asset allocation. So we've got we've got three things going on at the same time, and I think that gives us a, a really good opportunity. Good point. Thank you, Jeff. Is there any more uh, questions? No. Right, so uh, we are asked to approve the rise risk register. Is that agreed? Thank you, that's agreed. Um, the next item is uh, the pension fund uh, annual report and accounts on pages 357 to 452. Declan will present this report uh, members will note that this report was previously circulated for the schedule meeting on the 9th of September. So, over to you, Declan. So, we've a very quick introduction. Members will be pleased to hear not the full, however, 100, many hundred pages. The, I have to say, questions, comment. The only real update from what's there is that the, the auditors are still working through the, the pension fund. They're expecting now to be sort of, uh, to finish the audit at the end of November. It's still going to sort of, it's going to miss the committee slide cycle site so it's still going to be January before it gets uh, approved but we'll we'll come back to uh, we'll update this committee on anything that the sort of the audit findings but the the indication so far it's more, more kind of minor sort of restatements as opposed to anything kind of more fundamental but we'll we'll update the committee with the sort of the outcome of the audit but I'd have to take questions or comment on the rest of the rest of the paper. Okay. Thanks Declan. Has anybody got any questions or comments? No. So, uh, first we were asked to note the progress report provided by the external auditor, which anticipates issuing an unqualified opinion on the pension fund accounts. Is that agreed? Yep. Yeah. Second, we asked to note the Corporate Governance Committee will receive the external audit of the 2021-22 Leicester County Council Statement of Accounts, Annual Government Statement and Pension Fund Accounts on the 27th of January 2023. Is that agreed? Thank you. Finally, we ask to approve the Pension Fund's annual report and accounts subject to its consideration by the Corporate Governance Committee. Is that agreed? Yep, agreed. So and we're on to item 16. Any other items which uh, the Chair has decided to take is urgent? Uh, we have no urgent items. The date of the future two meetings are outlined on uh, uh, item 17. Members are also asked to note that the fund's annual general meeting will take place on the 12th of December 2022 at 12 noon and will be all open to all scheme members and uh, members of this committee. OK, so on to item 18. The public are likely to be excluded during consideration of the reigning items in accordance with section 100A subsection 4 of the Local Government Act 1972 exempt information. We now move into private uh, session for consideration of the remaining items. 
Uh, please could I ask any members of the, in the public guide to leave the meeting and the live stream will now end.